and we are just recording it for the benefit of uh, those who are having some challenges could you please confirm if you are able to hear me well fantastic thank you thank you okay uh, so without much delay it's going to be really quick and of course i'm going to uh, keep the floor open for uh, some q and a we will also pick up a mock question paper we may not have time where i ask you to answer but what i will do is i will answer it and i'll give you the rational why this is the answer and that is not the answer right with that as a background let's quickly get started this is uh, a session where uh, i'm doing it purely on a voluntary basis again hang on i'm not standing for any council elections or any of those it's just purely from an academic interest perspective right uh, so with that as a context we are going to quickly look into sweet capsules in terms of two on 3.0 and one of the most common questions is you know how do i get started the first thing you need to get started is by understanding the marks if you look from a marks perspective the dsa 2.0 which is the last exam proposed now right so the allocation is as below what you notice the first chapter has about 20% weightage followed by chapter number 2 which is 13% right and chapter number 3 which is another 13% chapter 4 is the huge 20% there again 14 uh, chapter number 5 is system development 14% again chapter 6 is software audit and 7 is business continuity your tip number 1 if you are studying this chapter chapter number 2 and chapter number 6 has to be read together why lot of similarities lot of similarities and you'll realize when you're going through it right quickly moving on sir what about chapter number 1 chapter number 1 is actually speaking it covers a lot of introductory concepts let me tell you those introductory concepts are very important because for that you will not be able to understand the concepts of audit from an examination again all of this discussion we going to have is purely from an examination not from a practice perspective first is examination right so when we look into from that angle chapter number 1 has lot of introductory concepts chapter number 2 if you ask me is the easiest chapter the easiest chapter why it is all about audit it is all about audit and some things we have been you know specializing over years right and if you look into chapter number 3 you start going through it in a strict parlance you may actually find it a little too dry and therefore i will suggest a small change in approach when it comes to this particular cha uh, chapter chapter number 4 as i said it's a little technical 5 was never done as part of your syllabus because it was a e learning material i repeat it was an e learning material therefore you need to look into it at least to get a perspective but what i've done is i've digested it in a fairly easy to understand manner so that you can probably pick it up and then comes this very very interesting module 7 uh, module 6 i spoke of module 7 which is business continuity audit right now how does this change when it comes to dsa 3.0 here is the allocation your information system audit process is 18 which is nothing but the similar thing what you notice over here chapter number 2 right governance management enterprise it risk compliance and a bcm is nothing but the previous section chapter 3 and chapter 7 combined right now comes to uh, chapter number 3 is all about system development acquisition maintenance audit so which is nothing but your system development chapter number 5 year you have information systems operation and management again it sort of embedded within five and then you have protection of information system which is the highest again here at another common area and then last you have emerging technology which are the new things right so between the 2.0 and 3.0 there is definitely some lot of overlap and that's why i decided to do a combined approach but nevertheless don't break your head saying that you know sir wow, how does it matter for me all of those things what is the most important thing as of now is what are those sweet and short steps i need to take Three days or four days before exam, so that I can crack it. it. That's the essential thing. And if you have any expectations, you can probably put it in the chat window. But nevertheless, I'll try my best to you know address most of these things, right? With that as a context, let's quickly get started. What are the reference materials you need to go through, right? Okay, the Institute Study Material, which is obvious. The DSA Question Bank. For various reasons, in uh, DSA Question Bank 2.0 is available. Three point uh, we don't have a separate question bank, but definitely worthwhile looking into it. right and mock test paper is again available in institute website please pick it up and if you want conceptual clarity on any of the topics you can pick up these materials from the link this is already hosted on to my google drive so therefore you can actually pick it up and absolutely fine with that as well right now few caveats when it comes to this 
so by only going through this will i be able to clear the exam no that's not what i'm trying to say but it will give you a very very quick birds eye view of your entire syllabus so what it does is sort of saves a a huge amount of time for you right and that's very critical especially in this uh, you know uh, era where we are crunched for time right so that is basically what i'm going to be covering and a few general tips first if you look into your entire system or the structure in which the paper is being made right it is predominantly driven based on combination of two things one is probably i will use the word common sense driven and this is something which you can easily pick it up and crack why do i say that this is because for a simple reason this is all extension of a topic like audit example what is audit risk right so this is something which is definitely covered within your domain of audit where do you use substantive testing and compliance testing right so those are something which easily gets covered when it comes to the element of audit right so that becomes handy for you on the flip side you also have certain technical concepts and which are these technical concepts classical example of these technical concepts my dear friends are all to do with your um uh, protection of information assets let's take that as a very simple example right protection of information assets is fairly detailed when it comes to you know a uh, lot of uh, requirements with respect to controls risk understanding the nomenclature naming Right? and that becomes a slightly important from that perspective now what if i am not able to you know get through on those this is where you'll have to slightly balance it out because there is no doubt some element of high level element of uh, you know uh, or extensive element of uh, i would probably use the word uh, technology but yes it is not something which is not achievable right? so that is something which i thought i should definitely give you a heads up right and quickly moving further what are the very simple strategies which you need to look at the strategy number one or the tip number one is pick and choose typically a shopping cart approach means what your contents are the most important thing for you to actually get an idea of your syllabus with the three days available right you it is impossible for you to sit and glance through each and everything so what is it that i need to and choose as i said right? read the glossary right and there is a separate glossary of terms which is given again in the google drive where i have shared a lot of information you will be able to pick that up read the heading this is a pro tip and this works many of the times anywhere in your material where you find three or four bullet points that's an examination question and read the heading before that my dear friends that's where they ask you question from right the questions could be two varieties they pick up a particular line from those options and they say this is relating to which of them for example which of the following controls are designed in such a way it avoids an issue from occurring preventive directive correctly right they use the word avoid that means what are they referring to preventive control right or they can ask you all of the following are basic classification of controls except preventive directive corrective lead right so that's how it is so read the heading sentence prior to the bullet point that could be an examination question always remember the topic with three to four bullet points very very handy now comes the most important thing right i've done a lot of research and i thought it makes sense to summarize how to answer mcqs in probably three to four slides first the institute the way the questions are asked especially in an information system audit course is such that the they give you multiple options and many a times you tend to feel that okay both the options are of almost importance right and that is where the best answer strategy is something very very important not every answer is the same you might sometimes require to be choose between two right ones a simple example which of the following is the best technique to prevent a denial of service attack right first mechanism is a firewall second mechanism is a captcha code third is a digital signature fourth is an otp right all the four can be used to prevent a denial of service attack but the most easiest to implement and economical and the most efficient is captcha and that's why the gst website income tax website any of these fairly website which has multiple people logging in has a mandatory element of captcha 
right? So which among the following? Choose between two right ones. Best first must, right? Please be very, very cautious. And mind you, in the examination, they will not highlight this word best as bold or, you know, capital letters. I hope that you get it. Second, analogy type of question. There is a relationship asked between two variables and you are expect, expected to answer the relationship between one versus the other. Example, higher the humidity results in dash. Lower the humidity results in dash. Higher humidity is high possibility of corrosion. Lower the humidity, high possibility of static electricity. Now that's an analogy question. I hope you're able to hear me out, right? The third is a reserve type or a negative type question, right? In many cases, you are required to select the incorrect response. Please be very, very careful with the word not because many a times we are so positive in life that we forget to read the word not or a negative, right? Please be extra cautious there. Wherever the word not negative is there, while reading it, you'll get it. And of course, you need to choose one correct answer, right? So these are simple straightforward questions. Sometimes you'll have a simple one question, right? Next. How do I answer MCQs? The first thing which you need to do is please read the entire question. So you have 200 questions and you have four hours. That's massive. 50 questions for an hour, right? Of course, less than a minute for a question, but it doesn't mean that you will run out of time. Definitely more than sufficient, right? So read multiple choice questions in entirety. Second, read every answer, every option. Because just when you thought this option B is best, you will jump into option C. Just when you saw option C is best, probably option D is more relevant. So please be very careful. See if you could answer in your mind first, what are they trying to test you, right? And every MCQ question, let me tell you, my dear friends, has a concept called as a STEM. You heard me, right? STEM, right? STEM refers to a concept where the core aspect in the question they are testing. I'll give you examples to each of these things what I'm speaking of, each of these things, right? So here what happens is you, you could probably cover the answers, just focus on the question, see what is the core thing they're asking in the question. I will take you through each of these cases, you'll be able to understand. And the principle of odd man out actually works. I repeat, principle of odd man out actually works. Now, what is an odd man out? We It is very, fairly easy, you know, where you find four options and one of those options normally tends to not align with the rest of them. And that's most likely probably the answer. One other tip, you know, some, uh, you know, recently somebody was asking me, sir, if they've given all of the above, can I by default to choose answer as all of the above? No, please be very, very cautious. Not everywhere all of the above may be very handy, right? So there might be a situation where there is one which is better than all of the above. So therefore that one you'll have to look into, right? Next, eliminate wrong answers. Start the rejection approach. Four options is there, right? An extension of the odd man out principle. You feel this is not there, this is not right, this is not right, right? So keep on rejecting. Problem here is you will choose between those two, right? Now, this is where the challenge is. Choosing between one and two, which is C and D or A and B, A and A, A and D, whatever. Right now, this is purely based on concepts and based on experience, right? So this is something which you have to be very handy. Now, many of them again ask me, sir, I've already written this exam so many times and I'm unfortunately I'm losing out in the border range. So let me tell you one simple analogy when it comes to DSA exam. First, 200 mark questions, that is 100%, right? 10%, you would not even have heard of those things. Be ready for it. Because our extent of preparation may not be so much, probably the depth at which we have prepared, whatever reasons. 10%, you may feel that you have not even heard of it. So ignore that 10%. That means you are focusing on the 90%. Now, out of 90%, there is a good possibility that 50% we will surely be able to answer. 40 to 50 percent we'll surely be able to answer your minimum required percentage i think is 60 right so 40 to 50 you'll easily be able to answer the question is the balance 10 to 20 percent is where the effort is necessary especially you are losing out because either this option or this option this option or this option and that is where i have made my slides in the subsequently wherever you tend to make more mistakes that is something which i've picked it up right so you will get a clarity on how you should analyze those questions right? And sir, what if I do not know the answer? No problem. Ignore it. 
put a circle whatever do not answer that mcq and if you are going through the omr please be very very careful if you are not answering the 13th question going to the 14th question make sure 13th is left bank and 14th you color it right very very important in that in that heat or in that examination tension we probably will you know miss it last many a times making an educated guess works right so it is some sort of an educated guess we need to give right some sort of a choiceful guess or the most obvious choice which you may probably have to give and i'll give you examples for each and every one right uh, as i said there is no separate mock test for 3.0 currently everything is there only for 2.0 the institute is still developing but let me tell you 2.0 is definitely a good mock test for you 2.0 is definitely a good mock test field, right? So, okay, what if that I have got a concept or I've had a topic and I've not even known, I don't even know that, no problem, just go and answer it, right? And let me also tell you one very important thing, right? What you need to do in the next three days, right? Today we are at Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, effectively two days, right? Now, what is it that you need to do? Pick up MCQ questions which are there on the website or your, or your study material. Start going through them, right? The way you should do is, like, you know, people said, before food, you need to take a tablet. After food, you need to take that. So solve 15 to 20 questions before food. Have your food. Another 15 to 20 questions you solve. This way, you're trying to target 30 questions during a meal. When I say during, before and after. Six meals you're going to have for the next three days. So six into 30, 180 good questions you would have attempted it right and this is just before and after and during the course of the day whenever you're preparing to be morning afternoon evening wherever it is right try to focus on those questions or those contents especially where it has those bullet points those are definitely handy for you to pick it up right so i hope that gives you a perspective and gives you an idea I will give you all of these links. Don't worry. All these links are available and it is also available in the WhatsApp group where I've been mentioning it. And I'll definitely give you. So help me out to finish this entire course content and all the links I will share with you. I hope that's okay. Right? Yeah. One of the pro strategies which I follow, right? And this has helped me crack most of these examinations, including CISA and other things. And by the way, CISA examination, I cleared amongst the top 20% in the world. So that gives me a perspective of how the questions are sort of answered or what is the approach. The first, given an option with various choices, the question always says, which among the following is the best? A prevent, an option which indicates preventive in nature is always the best strategy compared to that of a detective or corrective, right? A simple example could be, which of the following is an excellent control for ensuring access is restricted, right? Access control list, review of access, identifying access excess cases or let us say fixing the access issues the answer is access control list why it is a preventive all of them are good practices preventive is better than detective likewise detective is better than correct right first remember that second whenever you're answering imagine that you're auditing one of the largest companies in the world there are no budget constraints at all, right? There are absolutely no budget constraints. So which means you are fairly keeping it open-ended. Do not bother about those so-called budget. Okay, this is a small client, how will that work out? No, unless the question says for a small and medium enterprise or a question like that, right? So that's your special tip. Tip number three, auditor can never do any sort of implementation, any control or any topic which talks about auditor implementing certain things is not permitted, is not permitted, right? So that is not often one of the answers. Fourth, a question which is asked almost every examination and every time people make a mistake, backup is always corrective 
not preventive. Why? By taking backup, can you prevent something from happening or not happening? No. By taking backup, if something has taken place, you can correct it, right? So understand the purpose of each control. That's the most important thing. And last, many a times, we tend to use our personal bias of auditing a smaller company, a SME client or tax audit client, whatever it is, while trying to answer, please keep that bias slightly away, right? So that is something which you should probably focus on, right? So can we look into a very, very sample set of questions so that you get a perspective of how to answer these MCQs? And I would be happy if you could answer the MCQs by typing it in the chat window. Are we okay, right? Let's quickly go ahead. And this is my personal favorite. This is a co concept which tests you on all the three or four areas. And this is where it is, right? Please look into it. I'll give you a quick 10 seconds. Please answer what you feel is the most appropriate in the chat window. Okay, interesting. All of them have only answered. Okay. Yes. See, the first thing is, what is the stem in the question? Let's try to understand. What is the stem in the question? The stem in the question, this is where I said, please do not fall for the trap. All four is the right answer. No. The stem in the question is, all of them are related to, right? The stem in the question is, the major part of the plan is executed before the disaster occurs, right? The major part is occurring when? Before the disaster. Hope that's clear. Now, when it means before, now we need to understand which among these four occurred before the disaster. Let's take one step back. What is the meaning of each four of each of these four? The first, if you look into emergency plan, the first, if you look into emergency plan, the way an emergency plan is at the time an emergency occurs, what is it that you have to do? That is what is an emergency plan. As simple as that. If an emergency occurred now, what is it that I will do? Right? As simple as that. The second would be, please bear in mind, will an emergency plan be executed before a disaster or after a disaster? It will be executed after the disaster. Emergency plan is executed after the disaster. No doubt you would have planned it. No doubt you would have planned it. But the majority is executed after the disaster. That means the question is not asking that. The question is not asking that. The question says slightly different. The question says majority is done before, right? So emergency majority is done after. Let's go to the second option. Second option is what? Backup. Do you do a back backup before or do you do the backup after? You do a backup before, right? So that means it is obvious, it is obvious that your backup, whatever you're doing is taking place before means that is definitely one of the options to consider is definitely one of the options to consider let's go to the next one the next option what does it say the next option says recovery when do you begin the recovery do you begin the recovery before after so therefore recovery is not the answer and last comes test when do you test the bcp you test the BCP on the date of disaster. Impossible. You test it before. Therefore, majority of the plan, which is test and backup, is executed before the disaster occurring. Therefore, the answer is option C. Right? It is not all the four. The classical example, which I said, not every case to have all the four may be the answer. Are you with me? Questions, clarifications. Anybody wants to have a quick
process you can probably raise your hand and i'll probably unmute you you're right c is the answer those who have joined in a little late c is the answer you're right good verified still having doubts fair enough let's quickly move on to the next question right now this is something which you can probably spend some time this is a little bit concept oriented topic if you have the concept i think you should be able to answer this let's quickly spend a few minutes to look into this Yes, the answer is transposition. You got it right. So first, we need to understand what is the meaning of each of them. Addition is instead of entering thirty-five, you added one more number. Truncation is. you reduced one number substitution is you altered say for example while typing instead of keeping your fingers on asdf you kept it on sdfg right so there is a quite a possibility of a substitution and last is transposition interchange now there could also be a variant double transposition right so where multiple two digits are looked into now what is a variant of this question they can ask you in the same question they will ask what if what if the certain values or certain alphabets were always replaced with certain other alphabets then it is substitution right what if certain alphabets always were not appearing or truncated in that case it will be truncation or addition right let's quickly look into the third a simple question even if you have not understood the logic you should be able to answer it even if you have not understood the logic you should be able to answer it and figure it out how you should be able to easily do looking for the keyword looking for the keyword i'm sure you'll be able to answer it yes this is very simple i am sending receiving therefore it is communication the answer is b communication control as simple as that right getting the confidence on terms of how to be looking into each of these right now this is another question where all of them or at least two or three of them are the right answer two or three of them are the right answer but you need to choose the best and the most suitable answer spend a minute with me okay out interesting answers coming up okay the answer here would be not of transaction rather it will be of e-commerce it is definitely a risk associated with control it is not related to securities as therefore eliminated it is a risk associated with transaction risk associated with e-commerce but this is a question specifically on e-commerce therefore the answer would be d and not c right i hope that's clear right and this could be another type of questions which you could also expect arrange the following in a chronological order which of these following comes first okay please note here it is not a b c d it is the order it is the order right so the ideal answer would be first there is an asset an asset has an inherent weakness which is a vulnerability vulnerability is exploited by the threat or a threat agent right as a result you have risk and then you have impact right or as a result you have an impact and that will in turn cause you a risk 
so the first is c followed by b followed by i sorry d and then comes a okay. and last you could expect a strange question completely out of the blue like this with your common sense you should be able to answer it Physical is common, probabilistic is common, human being is manual, therefore option C eliminate, human being is open as well as closed, therefore the answer is B, physical, probabilistic, manual, closed and open, right? It comes a very strange question, sir, how on earth is this relating to system audit or IT audit? See, systems are classified into open systems and closed systems. A classical example, your calculator is a closed system, right? A computer system is an open system and in that context, it becomes relevant, right? So now that we have got a perspective on how it is, right? Now what we're going to do is in the next few minutes, right? Or the, probably an hour or so, right? I'll quickly give you a gist of each and every chapter and how should one look at that chapter from an examination perspective, right? Now the concepts, whatever we're going to discuss, of course, in DSA 2.0, it comes as a primary aspect. It is applicable across the syllabus, right? So therefore we are focusing on core things, only those areas which is not there, I'll clearly call it out for either of them. Any system you look into it, my dear friends, this is the underlying categorization of a system. It has people, you and I, as end users, the ultimate user of that, the system administrators, developers, or could have simple users, say for example, accounts department, right? All of those are complex. Look from a computer system perspective, you have hardware and software. Hardware, you have the servers, simple language. These are devices which is accepting or honoring the request, right? And a client. Client is a machine which is sort of, you know, asking the request. A simple example is your office, you have a tally server and you have another system where your article is using it. The article machine you refer to as a client, whereas the server is basically your system or the so-called server, right? I mean, it's not a strict server client architecture. We'll come to it a little later. Terminals, configurations are all of this. Then you have software, broadly two things, operating system, application software. Operating system is the one which runs on the hardware right? And application is also called as a utility software, which runs on top of the operating system. So I have a hardware, a hardware is connected to an operating system An operating system is connected to an application software. Then of course we have data, it's raw facts, text, numbers, images, and network. You have concepts called internet, intranet, extranet. Internet, we are all aware, interconnection of net computers, intranet, connection within an organization or a restricted premises as an intranet a simple example the local lan in your office is an intranet so from d drive of a, a system to the e drive or you know from another system you are able to access that's an intranet if you're working from home you are accessing your main server then that is an extranet thanks to the technology called as a virtual private network vpn will touch upon it a few minutes from now right so coming to the hardware because in the interest of time, I may have to go very quickly. Hardware is a tangible portion. It normally consists of input processing, data storage, and output, right? Now, this is something which you're already aware, but the catch where they ask you questions is in this, the storage devices, right? Now, the storage devices, let me tell you my difference. You have one which is called as an internal memory, right? In simple language, these are processors, registers, which are probably, you know, very fast, right? But where you have very, very limited storage, right? And in order to bridge this gap between the primary memory, which you notice over here and the processor, you have a device called as a cache memory. I repeat it. In order to bridge the gap between this RAM and cache memory, sorry, and the processor or register, you have what is called as the cache memory. And what is a cache memory? Simple language, cache memory is a temporary memory, which bridges the gap between my internal memory called as registers and my primary memory called as RAM. 
what is RAM? RAM is where you're temporarily storing all of this information. A simple example is you're watching this particular webinar or a session through your screens, thanks to Zoom app, right? That is no doubt. But you may also be running some other application in parallel, right? Or you may probably still be doing office work or you might be going back home, driving, whatever X, Y, Z. Now, in all these cases, what happens? You are you applications in parallel. Now, this application is loaded on your RAM. Only then you're able to use that. Now, this RAM is a volatile memory. Power of everything disappears, right? A classical example, you restart your phone. All the open apps in your phone disappears, right? That's where RAM is. And what is ROM? ROM is a read-only memory, which is again a primary memory. It is the place where the boot sequence is defined. And what is a boot sequence? The moment you power on your system or your laptop, what is the first step, third step? Those are defined within the ROM, right? I hope it's clear. RAM is a volatile memory. ROM is a non-volatile memory. Both of them are primary memory. You have secondary memory, like your hard disk, pen drive, CDs, etc. Last very important examination question, virtual memory. Virtual memory is not a physical memory, but it is through an operating system. It converts some amount of your hard disk. I repeat, some amount of your hard disk, which is secondary memory, into a so-called internal memory, right? So that is basically done to enhance your processing speed and capability, right? So it's a virtual memory. It doesn't physically exist. Right. Quickly moving further, software, I think we've already spoke of. Software is a set of programs and instruction. There are primarily two variants on operating system and an application. Operating system could be Windows, Android, iOS. Application predominantly is your Zoom app is an application, your WhatsApp is an application, your photos, gallery, all of those are application. They have a utility. Next important question, hierarchy of or database, right? There's a very critical question. Now, this is somewhere many times they ask you a question to understand the structure. Let's take an example, the CA Institute with a member database. All of those member database is a collection of multiple files. Who are those files? For each member, U, I, A, B, C, all of them are files. Now, within each of those files, there are multiple records. The record could be about when you cleared your exam, what is your qualification, what are the number of years of practice, your FCA, ACA, whatnot, right? All of those are records. Each of those records is a collection of multiple fields. A field could be, when did you pass your exam? What is the exemption which you had got? right? Uh, how many years of practice are you in? Which firm are you in? Right? All of those are fields. And every field is a character, alphabet, data, numbers, numeric, and last character is a collection of bits, right? So that's basically a hierarchy of database. Now, what to expect in an examination? This is the most important. Knowing the concept is important. Equally understanding how the question will come in the exam. Exam, the question will ask you, which of the following is a collection of records? It could be file, database, field, character, right? A file best represents which of the following? Collection of file, collection of fields, collection of records, collection of characters, collection of bits, right? Interchange. So this is where the game is. The game of an MCQ exam is to understand where they will test you. And therefore you need to understand these bits and pieces I'm sure you'll be able to attack it. Right? Then comes a very interesting thing, database model. There are four types of a database model. Practical questions are being asked. The first one is a very, very simple one. It's called hierarchy. Inverted. What is an inverted tree? Tree has a branch, or sorry, a, a trunk, root trunk, and then various branches. Reverse it. I have a common parent. From the parent, the child comes into picture. Right. So we call this as a one-to-one -one relationship or one-to-many relationship. A network database is quite similar to that of this. Just that you have one to one, one to many, and, 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 and many to one. That means parents to child. The previous one was only a parent to a child. The advantage of a network database model, which is an examination asked question, which of the following database models represents redundancy the best? The answer is a network database, right? So that's the MCQ question. I hope you're able to get it, right? So that's the MCQ. What is redundancy? Duplication. Simple example. Sometimes in check, or rather most of, or every time in check, if it has to be honored, you need to write the number in words as well as figures. That's a redundancy, but it is necessary. But imagine saving the same thing again and again. Your manual 
accounts every time you have to pass an entry with let us say narsaman account debit you have to pass narsaman account debit once narsaman account debit twice in tally we don't do that we create narsaman's account first time and every time we want we just refer to that that's the mechanism of reducing redundancy right coming to rdbms one of the most popularly used database it follows a tabular approach that means all the data is stored in tables rows and columns tally follows that uh, relational database system, right? You heard you have one to one, one to many, many to one, and many to many. That means the most popular. And last, you have object oriented, typically used for images and objects, something like Ghana.com, YouTube.com, Google Image Search, etc. Another concept which may come up here is a data warehouse versus data mart, right? A data warehouse is an extracted version. And by the way, this is there in module uh, uh, seven emerging technologies in the new syllabus and in the old syllabus there in module one. That's why I keep on saying, you no, know, don't strictly go based on is it applicable, not applicable. If it is not applicable, I'll clearly call it out, right? So data warehouse is an extracted version of the primary database. I have a primary database and I have an extracted version of that primary database. Why? It is not practically possible for me to every time extract data from the so-called primary database. Why? It has so many columns, which is not relevant for me. And therefore, what do I do? I have an extracted version and that's called as data warehouse, right? So that's basically what you will have to consider. The next thing which you have to consider, my dear friends, is data mark. Now, what is a data mart? How different is the data mart? The data mart is a subset of a data warehouse. Repeat, subset of a data warehouse. Now, what is the meaning of this? Simple example could be departments. A simple example could be departments, right? Now, when you look into departments, that is where you get this application inventory department, you know, has finance, marketing, sales, accounting, all of those could be considered as a data mark. So multiple data marks consist of a warehouse. Examination question is this, which of the following is an extracted version of the primary database? Data lake, data warehouse, data mark, and something else. The answer is data warehouse. And what is a data mark? A subset of warehouse. Okay. Next, slightly moving, shifting gears, right? What are the issues to be addressed by network models? One of the most favorite examination question, both new syllabus as well as old syllabus. First thing is called a routing. Any network which has to go from source to a destination, you have to decide the route at which it takes. A simple example is you are going from your home to office. Is there only one route? No, it goes to multiple routes. That's the first decision a network has to take. Second, bandwidth. The amount of data which it can take. A simple example could be you in your residence wherever you are if the lane is very small only a small car can come in if a lorry has to come it is impossible right likewise imagine your road versus a state highway versus a national highway it can take more load bandwidth in a network context is you are live streaming video at the same time you are sending messages and at the same time you are downloading data is it possible earlier may not be possible today it is possible that's the higher bandwidth third resilience ability of a system to recover from an error a simple example could be you are speaking on phone suddenly the call drops within a few seconds it picks up that is resilience and last my dear friends is contention that is when two or three people are trying to reach a common destination or a common resource whom should i prioritize and that's called contention a simple example is you're also downloading a software your friend or your colleague or your office your uh, your family member is also listening to an online class whom do i prioritize if contention is not defined all of them are equally prioritized now what is the examination question again again i go back to examination questions right they could ask you which of the following refers to the amount of data that can be sent across the network routing bandwidth is this contention which of the following is a situation where there is a conflict for a common resource right and that answer is contention so all of those are areas which a network model has to address right before i go on just a quick pause is the flow and am i making sense for you right i might be going fast because for obvious reasons that we have lots to cover is the process flow and the thought process is it okay quickly in the chat window but <clears throat> thank you quickly moving further okay. now one of the factors now these are the factors which a network has to be addressed 
these are the factors that can impact the quality of a signal and these are your mcq options something which is not here is your answer in the exam what did i just say these four what you see are mcq options something which is not here is your answer in the exam meaning they can ask you which of the following are those which impact the quality of a signal attenuation distortion noise bandwidth the answer is bandwidth something which comes out of this that means if you have a three or a four options or four bullet points expect variance of those questions to be asked attenuation simple language you are shouting from here your family member is 100 meters away or 50 meters away they can hear you well go 500 meters they will not be able to hear that's attenuation as the signal travels it loses its strength full stop distortion today the signals comes through multiple signals right when all of them are aligning at different times there is a distortion a simple example could be sometimes when i speak or you have heard in webinars that the audio may slightly get dragged distortion noise unwanted signal say for example when you are attending a session all of a sudden there is some sort of a background noise here in my office right right i mean of course and now there is nothing there hopefully it doesn't get, we don't have it but that could probably create some sort of a ruckus and that's noise a few concepts in network packet packet is the fundamental unit of data which is transferred over the internet by the way this entire presentation will reach you so you need not worry right i will share and i will give you the google drive link where it is pushed up or put into in case if you have not joined the whatsapp group where we are sort of you know hosting all of this please make sure that you are part of the group right so this is something which you can probably uh, find it handy and useful right? so and if you want the group link i'm just sharing it in the chat window and coincidentally we had more than i think at least about 1000 plus people already forming part of these groups so that's the reason i had to create a group as well yes and by the way this is purely voluntary even though if you have not for the session i've still given you the access because the intention was obviously knowledge and if you are getting if you are learning nothing wrong in contributing a little to the the thing right and i'm I, this is just a, a ngo which we sort of you know operate in yes coming up are you sharing this ppt yes sir i'm definitely sharing this ppt feel free to look into it and you know make use the best use of it coming back can i am quickly continue packet is a fundamental unit of data which is transmitted over the network every piece of data is transmitted and this is what we call it as a packet switching a simple example a message could go with in these channels and reach the ultimate destination right the next is this is how i said it could go through multiple channels for example node a right you could probably you know go like this another packet could go like this the packet go like this you know this is what is called packet switching and that's one of the reasons where sometimes it says 99% download complete and you still have that 1% it takes a significant amount of time right quickly moving further you have something called as a mac mac is also referred to as physical address every device will have a physical address based on the nic and that's called mac media access control and this is called as a physical access right next is a repeater repeaters are nothing but in our offices or homes we call it as a range extender right they do not amplify very important they do not amplify the signal but rather receive the signal and regenerate it that's the reason if your modem is at one corner of your home and your tv is on the other corner and you're watching netflix or amazon prime whatever right you find sometimes the buffering that's because of the speed right or that's because of you know the distance of course bandwidth also could be another issue but one of the most popular examination question bridge bridge connects two lands bridge connects two lands ground floor you have office fifth floor you have an office both of them are your own offices between the floors you were not able to get it right you are connecting the ground floor all machines to a bridge that bridge in turn connects to the ground floor or the fifth floor as the case may be and that is in turn connected with all of them right as simple as that and that's basically so you can say station a station b which is in segment 1 as one floor right and this as another floor next is the concept of a router a router is a device that receives analyzes the packets and routes them towards their destination right the beauty of a router is it connects two lands over a wide area network over a wan 
example office in bangalore office in chennai both of them are my own offices and i want to get connected we use a router right so most of your uh, internet uh, with this powered by uh, you know optic fiber cable goes through a router of course that's another areas other days discussion so the most popular question distinguish between bridge and a router in terms of an mcq next is what is called as a switch right so switch before that i'll probably speak of hub right a hub is a simple example it is is nothing like a junction box when you power a junction box let's say in your office you have you have to connect your monitor you have to connect your printer you have to connect your uh, cpu you nor have only one socket what do you do you buy an extension cord or a junction box you plug all of them that's a simple example of a hub instead of a power it is data instead of power it is data so it's a simple network device that connects all other devices and it simply sends and receives the packet as simple as that hub does not have intelligence it will send everything to everybody on the contrary switch has intelligence in all our offices we have a switch this is the device where your internet connection directly is plugged in and all your lan cables are plugged in thanks to the switch only your office lan is actually working right so that's basically a switch right this is how the combined structure will look like switch a bridge a repeater a router and very important immediately after the router should be the firewall why because that is how it will filter what is the incoming and outgoing traffic and of course it's another matter that in our offices we may or may not have a firewall let's not get into that sort of a complicated discussion then comes the network topology there are four topologies ring unidirectional every device is connected to two devices ring unidirectional every device is connected to two device advantage very fast disadvantage one gets connected entire network off star all devices are connected to the central topology or the central device normally this is the switch right our offices use a star topology majority of the short term locations always use a star topology advantage very easy to configure just bring one extra wire disadvantage single point of failure central hub goes everything goes but bus a central wire you can imagine running from kashmir to kanyakumari everybody gets connected right so there is a huge dependency on the central wire therefore there is a huge possibility of traffic last is a mesh i have not named it it's a mesh topology every device is connected with every other device that means if you have 10 devices nine connections eight devices seven connections that means every device is connected to every other device n minus 1 connection highest redundancy extremely good for military example you can imagine the unfortunate attack which is happening at you know russia and uh, the neighboring state right so there because they may have military has a mesh topology even if one gets disconnected others also will work next transmission modes are of three types simplex one way transmission radio television half duplex you either speak or receive both the things are not possible classical example walkie talkie third duplex data flows in both the directions classical example telephone right you speak to your spouse on a lighter note you also speak she or he also speaks nobody understands anyway it's just on lighter right? lan man van lan within an office man within a city van across city classical example of lan our home classical example of man metropolitan area network good old in cable tv connections probably before this uh, set of boxes became popular and the third is wan wide area network across the entire internet your clients could also be classified server client technology as i said is based on a server who is actually accepting all the requests and sending the data or receive you know processing it the client is a fellow who is asking for this right and this server client could be of three types fat thick client thin client hybrid fat or thick is a classical example of our own systems our own offices right we the system where we are using tally your article staff or your employee is connecting to the server but it can do anything other than accounting as well thin client is a classical example atm machine it can do only specific things nothing beyond that a terminal where you check your pnr status at the airport or you print your boarding pass all of those are thin client hybrid is a combination of both of them architecture two tier versus a three tier a two tier architecture means it has only two layers a simple example is your mobile phone it has a database layer it has a presentation layer or a client layer right a simple example if you want to send a message on whatsapp 
your WhatsApp opens gallery, gallery say data or whatever is there, you're sending it. So if there is a database, understand your gallery as a database, your WhatsApp as an application layer or a presentation layer, right? When it comes to three distinct layers, so three there, it follows a different approach. Presentation layer, app layer, data layer. Example, SAP. What you see on SAP is different. The SAP application server is different. The database of SAP is different. Your net banking, or your core banking solution. All of these again have three different setups, right? Next, VPN, very important, virtual private network. A connection using the internet, I am establishing an intranet. I repeat, I'm establishing an intranet using internet. This is popularly called as an extranet, extended internet. A simple example, I am at my home, I want to connect to my office server, right? One option is from my home to an office, I put a secure line so that only I can answer or attend it. But it is practically impossible, right? You have 10 employees. Can you have 10 wires going to each of their houses? No. So what do I do? I use the internet. I have a small admin agent in my system and they are an admin agent. Using this admin agent, he logs in over there in a secure manner and he knocks it. This fellow accepts it and a secure tunnel is created. And that's called as a virtual event network. Transmission modes, parallel versus serial. What you see on the left-hand side is parallel. Printer, your dot matrix printers uses parallel transmission. Eight bits of data go in parallel, right? Eight bits. Whereas serial is one after the other. Your USB uses a serial transmission, right? Synchronous and asynchronous transmission. A simple way of looking at it is if the sender and receiver are active at the same time, that is called synchronous transmission. Sender and receiver are not active at the same time, but still message can be sent, asynchronous transmission. SMS, WhatsApp works on an asynchronous transmission. Your call, telephone call or a mobile phone call works on a synchronous. Only if you are there, I can call up and communicate the message. OSI model, very, very important, right? The seven layers, OSI model is not there in the new syllabus. They're only in the old syllabus. Just all, whatever we discussed remains false. So it is basically the layers at which you're communicating, right? So you have the application layer. It sends data, email, whatever we're referring to. It uses the protocol of HTTP, FTP, SMTP. Presentation layer, it is all about encryption, decryption, right? Session layer establishes the session, like a net banking session. Transport layer, sending the information and receiving. Network layer, it uses the IP and protocol. Data link layer, it connects with your Mac and then your physical layer, that's actually the physical substance. Shortcut to remember the TCP IP model or rather, you know, this model. It is all, all people seem to need data processing. I repeat, all people seem to need data processing. These are 2.0 syllabus. If you are not able to remember this, mug it up. You don't have an option, right? At least for the examination. Practically how it is used, all of those things are outside of our discussion because of the purely examination oriented discussion. The TCP model, it, or the OSA model translates into a TCP IP model, which is slightly better. The application layer takes care of the first three. Transportation layer does the same thing. The internet protocol layer does the network. And then you have the network layer, which does the data interface. Physical remains as it is. Only these two slides are not applicable for the new syllabus, 3.0. Old syllabus alone, it is applicable. In fact, cryptography, across everybody applicable. Conversion of a plain text into an encrypted cryptography what is plain text abc i am sending a message to you i do not want anybody to be aware of that so what do i do that abc i convert into one two three or some numbers a represents one b represents two some sort of a language and that is called as an encryption plain to cipher text is called encryption cipher text to plain text is called decryption there's a common topic again available at this. analysis of this is called crypto analysis encryption has got two methods symmetric asymmetric it is like saying I use the same key to lock, same key to unlock, symmetric. Same key to uh, different key to say uh, one key to lock, another key to unlock. That is called symmetric. Symmetric. Same key lock, same key unlock, symmetric. Symmetric. Same. Different is called asymmetric. A symmetric, right? 
It's one of the network security protocol is a concept of SSH. Whenever you enter a, your username password, you are setting up a connection, a secured connection between your system and the other system. And that's an SSH protocol, right? It logs into another computer over a network, executes command in a remote machine and moves the file from that to here, right? That's an SSH. Whereas SSL, moment you come back, the question is whether you want to come back only for once or, or you want to establish a session. When you want to establish a session, you follow a secure socket layer. A simple example, when you are logging into your internet banking, you enter the username password, there is an SSH which pushes, reaches until the end server, pulls the layer and comes back, right? And therefore your internet connection is working. Oh, sorry, your net banking is working. SSH is like a bulletproof car. SSL is like a bulletproof train or a bulletproof tunnel. I hope that helps, right? Firewall versus intrusion. Very, very popular examination question. Firewall is a preventive, preventive, preventive control. Intrusion detection system is a detective. That means firewall will not allow something to happen. Whereas intrusion detection will not bother about it happening. If it happens, it gives an alert. A simplest example is if something I'm wearing a mask is a preventive control, right? Where you're coughing continuously, that's a detective control. Somebody says, hey, you need to get diagnosed or whatever expected, or just take a medicine, right? So firewall, intuition, point number. Both of them have certain common methods. Network-based, host-based is also available in firewall, also available in intuition. But I'm just picking up the specific things. Network-based, you have an entire connection. I place the firewall in your connection. That is, after your router, before your switch, I place the firewall. So all the traffic which is coming in and going out is getting filtered. That is what is called network-based firewall. The same firewall, I can paste it in your laptop or in somebody else's laptop. That is a host-based firewall. Likewise, IDS also works. Then you also have a personal firewall, which is again for your personal computers. Then you have what is called bastion host examination asked question. They have hardened systems. That means they have standardized bastion systems, which are hardened. Therefore, it makes it difficult for you to attack. Now, firewall also has got nature based and statistical based. Intrusion also has got this. Now, what is this? See, you know, imagine there is a malicious fellow who's coming in, right? Can I know the list of all malicious people? The answer is no. So, how do I do it? I create a setup which is having a particular signature. A virus has a particular pattern. So, based on the virus signature, it will identify. That's called signature based. Sometimes, based on signature, I cannot identify because if I, instead of Mr. X doing, Mr. Y is going to do that. Act. Therefore, I don't go based on the signature. Rather, I go based on the behavior. And that is called as a statistical anomaly based. Sometimes also referred to as heuristic. Heuristic. Popular examination question. Which, is the, which among the following is the most preferred firewall solution? The answer is statistical because it's anomaly linked and it's also, you know, behavior based. Uh, one of the other areas where popularly question comes. Private encryption versus public encryption. Private encryption is always used for a message. I am sending something to you. You use a private encryption. Therefore, it is sort of secure. What is a public encryption? For this entire session, I use a public encryption. Right? So that if I'm sending something to you that is private encryption, for the entire session, I use a public encryption. Second, private is used for encrypting my message. Public is used only for a signature. Which means, if I have to focus on integrity, I use a private. If I have to focus on confidentiality, or sometimes even authenticity, I focus on public. Are we clear with this? Private will ensure integrity. There is no modification. Whereas a public will ensure confidentiality. So now, classical examination question. Where do I use private? Hash of the message with the sender's private key. I am sending you a message. The message is hashed. What is hashed? Converted into an encrypted form. On top of that, I apply the private, private key. Right? Apply the private key. What happens? It will ensure whatever I am sending cannot be modified. Authenticity is taken care. Integrity is taken. Because I have given my this I have given my private key. By the way, digital signature is the next version. It's much more advanced than a private key, right? So digital signature is much more advanced, right? So private key. Now, what is a pub? What do I do with the public key? Now, I'm encrypting the message with your public key because your public key, I also have access. 
you are public key i also have access i encrypt it with the receiver's public key therefore it ensures confidentiality i'll give you an example i am sending a confidential mail which only you should open i will encrypt with my private key as well as encrypt it with your public key why only you can open and you want to know that only i have sent it therefore i will use it reverse i am sending a mail to everybody in the world i am sending a mail to everybody in the world is there a confidentiality no but does everybody in the world want to know that i only have sent it yes therefore i will only use a private encryption no public encryption this is a small concept of virtualization this is module 6 module 6 in the new syllabus again here i will just make a gist because there i am not spending uh, this in too much detail virtualization is physically one virtually many or virtually one physically many simple example a concept of virtualization in very very layman's language how does it look you have one computer four people want to access the same computer same time without impact impairing each other so what do i do that server you create a virtual setup with four connections or four login ids all of them at the same time can access and that's basically what is called virtualization simple example your uh, clouds and all of those operate on the virtual right another example of a virtualization is i have three or four systems all the three four systems has limited limited memory i want to use all of these three systems i repeat i want to use all of these systems combine it into a larger and that is possible thanks to the virtualization technology i hope you are clear with this virtualization physical to uh, virtual virtual to physical one to many many to okay next is a grid computing this is a concept where unused resources are shared within the computers within the grid example is i have a system where hard disk space is not hard disk space is not fully used you have another system where hard disk space is not fully used whereas the third system want to utilize your both unused system and it creates a virtual layer please note it is not saving in your system and their system it is creating as one layer for me physically it may be different but virtually there is one layer and therefore that is called as a grid computing and last is a cloud computing cloud computing is the same extension of grid but anybody in the world can use it right so you pay only for what you use in the layman's language it is somebody else's system for example you are storing something on google drive it is on google server where is you they have given you an app and therefore you are actually accessing it this cloud has got e models deployment models ias pass saas and on premise everything you own up networking storage virtualization middleware runtime in ias what happens amazon gives this services which is mentioned below you manage the top that means up to the virtualization layer they'll give you you will install the operating system middleware runtime when it comes to a platform as a service uh, amazon or google provides all of this you only manage application and data and when it comes to saas right everything is managed by that entity except data data ideally some portion they manage it some portion you manage it right? i hope that gives you a perspective i'll just stop over here if you have any questions to quickly take it fair enough i'm quickly continuing the next topic which we're going to discuss is what is called as is audit which is both again a combination in dsr 2.0 as well as 3.0 very very important 3.0 22% marks weightage and i think 2.0 is almost around 18% marks weightage very important fundamental right it's very very fundamental yeah niharika i'll refer to private and public a little later because in the interest of time we have to cover a lot more and just to give you a heads up i think i have close to about almost close to about 300 slides right almost close to about 300 slides and all of this i have made it as infographics and small topics so that you will find it very very handy and i think we are less than about i don't know how many slides away do you see a page number on the slide i don't see it okay and yes <laughs> let's look into it one at a time okay quickly moving on the definition of an is audit is something quite similar to what you would have heard across in the case of an internal audit the only difference is it's an independent examination of data statements records operations or performances right so that's basically what we are looking into 
ppt will be slide shared sir no problem i will give that to you so just hang on for some time focus on this session for the next couple of hours i know it's a little hard to sit for 3 hours you can think that you know we are discussing for the examination for all of this recording also i will see how best i can make this available so please give me time for that right so definition of audit it is all about a ex independent examination of data statement and records it is expressing an opinion on the erp information system application etc as an is auditor you collect the evidence evaluate it and see whether it is true and fair from a system control perspective okay? now what exactly or how are these system audits classified first based on compliance maybe rbi says you have to do it the payment card industry says you have to do it or there is a financial audit right because you do a, you are signing off a balance sheet uh, uh, then you as a no statutory auditor you are not sure whether the financial statements the assertions are they operating well so therefore it comes as financial audit then you have an operational audit operational audit are designed to evaluate the internal controls logical access security control what not then you have an integrated audit it's a combination of either of those administrative audit more on the operational efficiency productivity or some cases you do a forensic audit or a post mortem investigation right by the way when it comes to forensic audit there's one concept called chain of custody chain of custody i think i've not mentioned it here it just occurred to me chain of custody is another examination asked question it is basically how the evidence from the time it is generated to the system until you are able to do a forensic analysis and bring it before the court of law that is called as chain of custody remember you will never do any forensic analysis on the primary data what you will do is you will take the primary data copy them into a fresh system generate a hash value of the old system and the new system both of them are matching then on the new system is where you will do a forensic analysis you can never do on the primary system that's basically how your chain of custody pre uh, preservation is enterprise risk enterprise risk is all about how you manage risk right enterprise risk is a combination of strategy what if your strategy goes wrong for example i am a cryptocurrency startup and i started it but for various reasons the government changed the regulatory and my strategy itself goes wrong environmental risk tomorrow the law of law changes with respect to dealing with a particular product right market risk a simple example i have a product but i am not able to sell it well credit risk i have given that person a loan and he is not able to repay it operational risk anything relating to day to day operations say for example he shared the password a person has you know lost something xyz then there is an element of compliance risk a compliance risk is an area where you are not complying with the legal or a regulatory form underlying all of this is what is called as an it risk or a technology risk and that's basically how the overall setup is right and i think we already know what is a risk likelihood an organization would face a vulnerability what is vulnerability inherent weakness right so these are a few examples of sources of risk commercial economic human behavior natural events etc these are self explanatory not spending much time related terminologies examination as question vulnerability inherent weakness in a system i repeat inherent weakness in a system it could be due to flaw it due to be a failure right a simple example is using windows 7 till now right windows 7 support is sort of outdated so therefore it becomes difficult using a password is easy a password which is easily guessable like you know so password as password password is 1 2 3 4 5 all of those things right next is a concept of threat a threat is basically an action or an event where there is a compromise on the quality where there is a compromise on the quality it has an possibility to inflict harm so that's the biggest thing right it could destroy the compilation system denial of services then you have what is called exposure exposure is the extent of loss the organization has to face i repeat the extent of loss the organization has to face when the risk sort of materializes right it can have a long term impact likelihood the probability that a threat will succeed in an undesirable event that means the possibility of a risk meet, you know actually materialize an attack an attack is something which will compromise the cia so that's basically the terminology very very favorite examination question countermeasure refers to any method which is deployed to reduce the vulnerability or the risk so by default you have an inherent risk to reduce that you are having a countermeasure simple example there is a possible threat of covid virus corona virus and therefore what is it that you have as a countermeasure wearing a mask as simple as that right example what would be the countermeasure for spoofing a user identity sending an otp 
you know having a stronger password having a biometric verification correct now even after you keep countermeasure can you remove the risk completely no you will still be left with some more risk that is called residual risk the risk which is left over after applying a countermeasure is called residual risk please bear in mind whether you have risk, risk can never be eliminated risk can never be there will always be a residual risk question is is that residual risk okay with you right a simple example a simple example now you are learning to bicycle right learning to cycle you, you your parent or you gave your uh, one of this to your side, side child so first you have those three wheel and you ask your child to wear a helmet okay great but when the hell you know child is going the, uh, those two extra wheels are removed and therefore you are cycling unfortunately fortunately the child falls so you feel that okay helmet is there at least the child is safe but what happens to the elbows possibility of getting hurt so you give a knee cap or an elbow cap that means your risk was of accident you kept a countermeasure of helmet you felt that the residual risk is not acceptable for you you kept another countermeasure what is another countermeasure elbow caps and knee caps and after that you feel that okay even after this if the child falls there will not be a major impact right that is called as risk acceptance that is called as risk acceptance right but please bear in mind it is not called as accepted risk is where there's a difference accepted risk accepted risk is a situation where i don't even keep a control i am accepting that risk a simple example could be i have to on an emergency basis go somewhere and i am not able to find a helmet and therefore i am still driving a bike without a helmet i am accepting the risk because there is a need of an emergency it could i mean you may do it by choice or other possibilities but that's where it is that means what is the difference risk is nothing but a combination of vulnerability which is exploited by the threat agent right risk is basically a combination of or risk is risk arises when a vulnerability is exploited by a threat agent first of all second how do i define risk quanti quantify risk probability also called as likelihood multiplied into the impact probability multiplied into impact or probability plus impact how you can call it is called as inherent risk for that inherent risk you keep a control to reduce that risk you keep a control to reduce that risk right and that control after you implement it right whatever risk is left over that's called residual risk that control is called as countermeasure right and after that residual risk you see whether that control is acceptable for you or not if it is not acceptable you further keep one more countermeasure keep on keeping it until you feel that this risk i'm okay with it right for example you are cooking okay you may not want the hair to fall and therefore you wear a cap right but you don't wear gloves saying that you know every time there will be a possible injury or something like that right so that's some sort of something like that. but what is accepted risk accepted risk is you know there is a risk and you are not taking any measure to reduce it and that's called accepted risk so here the summary is this inherent risk minus control is equal to residual risk inherent risk without control and you are still living with it that is called accepted risk risk management strategies are four avoid completely avoid it don't even go into it say you upgrade your technology go to an update windows whatever transfer or share give it to another person outsourcing insurance company etc accept the risk as i told you or mitigate the risk you put in some sort of methods right an examples could be you know your probability and your the uh, impact that is what you see if the probability is likely it is negligible it may be overall risk could be low but as if this probability is very very certain and it is catastrophic extreme then that means you have extreme amount of risk and how do you treat that risk if it is extremely high you try to avoid it if it is probably slightly above a particular range you may transfer it extreme corners you may mitigate it or this bottom you will accept it right the risk based audit approach this is just an example for you to get an idea you understand the business look into the prior results do an inherent risk assessment regulatory etc then you understand the internal controls control environment we'll speak about control environment a little later what are the control procedures detection control risk identify and do a compliance test very important we do a compliance test compliance test is a test 
to check whether are you complying with the internal controls defined by you. A simple example, most of the organizations you would have seen, the moment you an employee comes into, they do a temperature check. That's a simple compliance test, substantive test, test of transactions, analytical procedures, test of account balances. You do not check a policy, rather you check something else by which you get a comfort. A simple example, you check how many people attended a training. That's a compliance test. Right? You see the test results, that's a compliance test. But you randomly walk into one of the employees and ask him three questions saying that, do you know this or not? That's a substantive test, right? And then you conclude the audit. Very important, next three slides, audit risk. Is the risk that an auditor may issue an opinion or he may issue a clean report despite the fact that there is some problem, right? That And therefore he has not detected that material statement. That means the risk that his audit procedures, whatever, is not able to get identified by way of an audit. And this risk is a combination of three. Inherent risk, the default risk. Example, cash sales inventory. It's an inbuilt risk. Detection risk, the risk that an auditor is not able to detect the fraud through various substantive procedures. Please bear in mind, detection risk is always related to substantive procedures. These are all examination of questions. Control risk. Control risk is something a risk that my internal controls is not able to prevent it, right? Say, for example, I had a control, but management overrode that control, right? So that's a control risk. A detection risk could be in Satyam case, of course, Satyam case, you had control risk also. But if you had applied substantive procedures, probably you may have done a better thing. A simple, like, you know, bank account verification, asking an external verification is not a compliance, is a substantive procedure. But checking your, uh, you know, doing a daily BRS is a control risk, uh, is a is an internal control. I hope you are clear with this, right? Another example, I think in the bank, I've already given this, I will not get into it. Demilitarized zone, a very important examination question. Now, this is an area typically between two regions. This happened before, you know, between North Korea and South, Africa, South Korea. To so just to say, this is the area where people can come interact and speak without any sort of, you know, war hazards and other things. So the intention of DNZ is you have a very confidential setup. You don't want people to log in there. Rather, you are permitting people only to a particular region. So, right. So it separates a confidential LAN or a confidential network with an untrusted network. And that is where a DMZ becomes very, very handy. I hope you're clear. An example could be, you are going into an office. I'm talking in a physical parlance. Imagine on a virtual parlance, a little bit. You are going to an office. The only place they will permit you is within the visitor area. They will not permit you anywhere beyond that, right? So that's an example of a demilitarized. Detection risk cause of two types, sampling risk, non-sampling risk. Sampling risk, very important. Risk that I am drawing a conclusion based on the sample taken. That means I verified the sample, everything looks okay. I'm verifying the sample, everything looks okay, right? The risk is that me, by looking at the sample, I've concluded. It may be right, it may not be right. What are the conclusions I'm drawing? Everything as per sample looks okay. Therefore, our company is okay. Everything as per sample is not okay. Therefore, company is not okay. So these are called as samplings. Non-sampling, this could be anything. It could be because of oversight. I didn't bother to look into it. Then comes the most favorite thing types of internal controls, PDC, preventive, detective, corrective. And this is how the flow is. Preventive will not allow it to happen. Detective is, it will allow, it will not stop you from preventing, but rather it will detect something went wrong. Corrective is immediately taking an action. Please bear in mind, a corrective will work only if there is a detective. I repeat, corrective will work only if there is a detective. There's a classical example of how questions can be asked in examination. Controls, admin, technical, physical. On top, you have physical, detective, corrective. A combination of this is where they can ask you a question. Example, which of the following controls are detective and technical in nature? Right. One of the options will be centrally managed policy or log server. Rest all could be any combinations. Right. So any combinations, they can pick it up. And I think I posted this also in the WhatsApp group earlier as one of the examination tips. Right? And there's another examination, tip. which of the following could impact the threat or could impact or could be a cause of threat for an IS auditor, right? Self-interest, self-review, advocacy, familiarity. And this is something which you can look into in a line. If I have to explain self-interest is I am interested in the client. Say, for example, I'm also a shareholder or I'm interested in losing the client. So therefore, that's a self-interest. Self-review is last year I implemented this year I audit. 
advocacies i am rendering other services also to the client familiarity is that person is a very familiar relationship either by virtue of you know uh, you know knowing family significant influences intimidation is they trying to threaten you so these four these five scenarios expect various questions to come another interesting area where questions are asked is control self assessment this is nothing but the owner of the control itself does an audit i repeat owner of the control itself does an audit so that he can improvise it and normally is auditor will only facilitate it so they can ask your examination question what is the role in a csa for the is auditor the answer is here is auditor can only facilitate the workshop and nothing beyond that right uh, very very important next two slides methods of sampling attribute sampling variable sampling attribute is used for compliance variable is used for substantive i repeat attribute is used for compliance variable is for substantive what is attribute you are checking the presence of an attribute in the testing and that's what is used for attribute sampling compliance test simple way to remember att r a b u t attribute is a compliance is c and c are related close by variable and substantive v and s right variable is you are checking the population has got characteristics based on various scenarios various things and this is where you do you know your pareto analysis you do a risk based analysis sub uh, what is that uh, grouping right uh, you create them into groups right and based on that you do multiple tests now this attribute sampling further has bifurcation very important again examination attribute is used for compliance testing only first fixed sampling i just pick, pick up this many number of cases see whether the approvals are there or not example rate of occurrence in a population approvals there not there stop and go stop and go is basically prevent excessive sampling and stop the testing so you know that after you have reached a particular level of comfort you will stop testing right when less errors are found you will just say ah okay everything looks fine discovery sampling is reverse until you discover an error you will keep on auditing right expected occurrence is low this is normally used in case of fraud until you identify some issue you will keep on digging digging right so attribute sampling compliance test so what is opposite variable sampling substantive testing this is where you use a stratified sampling that means group the entire population based on stratum similar groups example sales which have happened between 0 to 100 rupees sales which has happened between 100 to 200 or all the transactions authorized by cashier all the transactions authorized between this time right that is a stratified unstratified it could be you know average represents total etc difference estimation combination of both audit charter next important question right audit charter please understand statutory audit is defined by statute internal audit is defined by whom somewhere you need to get power is audit internal audit all of these are defined by some person which is that powerful document audit charter it defines the purpose responsibility authority accountability all of those very important who examination question who should approve or authorize the audit charter it is the highest level when it comes to audit audit committee is the highest level in the absence of audit committee board of directors or board of governors right that will be your answer you clearly address the responsibility authority and it should also focus on purpose aims goals etc next compliance and substantive testing i think we already spoke of but example this is an examination question which are the following cases compliance testing is followed access program change control program documentation error checking right so you all the three except the error checking so this is a rough few examples of substantive versus compliance testing open for questions finding it useful i hope so yeah i'll just take one minute bio break and i'll be back if that, i hope that's okay right you can also quickly stretch your hands and legs take a couple of deep breaths because 7 30 we're discussing about it i know after a very very tiring day i know how complicated it is it's equally complicated for me because i'm starting a very early day but yes right let's quickly have a recording yes recording will be shared with you uh, but for the time being myself i'll just take a quick bio break and i'll be back folks i'm back thank you Next comes a very very interesting chapter chapter called as governance right now governance is all about i mean got various fancy names it's all about the top management's perspective regulation can happen with the night and there's a very very common topic chapter three in the disa old syllabus 
chapter 2 in the DISA new syllabus. When I say new syllabus 3.0, old syllabus is 2.0. First, very, very fundamental thing. What is governance? What is management? Governance is board of directors. Management is CXO, chief executive officer, chief operating officer, whatever you can call it. Right? Sir, so where does managing director fall under? Managing director is the bridge between both of them, right? So normally only in India, we have this concept called as a managing director, whereas in abroad, they use the word key managerial personnel who will fall within the CEO, right? The CXO and they are the management. Now, what will governance do? What will management do? Very important. Governance is EDM, evaluate, direct, monitor, right? Management plan, build, operate, run, all of those things, right? So that's basically the key difference, right? So in this concept of governance, you have a concept called enterprise governance and it consists of two things. The first one is called corporate governance, right? The second is called business governance. The corporate governance is bringing in that accountability and an assurance that everything is right. Business governance is more of profit, value creation, resource effective utilization. Both of them have interdependency. Right. So for the time being, you ignore this cross referencing mark, which you notice, right, let us stick on only to the linear approach, right, because I mean, if I have to explain the interrelationship between the, all of those, it will become a little clumsy out here. But in the interest of academic reference, we will probably, you know, ignore those both, right, let's le leave it over here. Accounting, assurance, corporate governance, business governance, value creation, simple way, conformity, performity, business governance is performance, co corporate governance, conformance. Corporate governance is, are you compliant with the law? Business governance is, what is your profitability, right? So your balance sheet audits, all of those come here. Your secretarial audit, your internal control audit will come under the corporate governance, right? And this is typically how a framework is designed, right? There's a stakeholder who is need, and there are three stakeholders needs, which is called as a driver, risk management, benefits realization, resource optimization. This is driven from the corporate framework, right? I want to manage my risk. At the same time, I want to get benefits. That means whatever my target is and my resources also I want to optimize. And that's basically the governance table. Based on this, your value is created. And for that, you create an IT governance system. Right? Very, very important examination ask question. Instance of good IT governance, bad IT governance. Right? Direct contribution to business, improvised effectiveness, high IT credibility. Bad governance, you know, low perception, ineffective IT, lower CIO, right? Failures, all of those are examples of bad IT, right? Next, what is a difference between a conformity and performity? Conformity is corporate governance, performity is business, right? Conformity is more with the board role structure remuneration. Performity is based on the strategic decision value, etc. Right? Your mergers and acquisition is based on your performance. Your ethics is conformance, right? You're getting a difference. Standards, code of ethics, conformity, performance is business practices tools. Sorry, am I recording this session? Is it getting recorded? Wait a minute. Remember hitting the button. Yeah. I see an option called pause recording, therefore it is recording. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Codes and best practice, right? Auditability. Auditability, conformity or corporate is I can audit it using methods, but there are different compliance oriented methods. Performity is something which is slightly difficult. No doubt you can say it's a profit, I can audit. But beyond a point of time, value, strategy, how will you audit? Those are not possible. Conformity, corporate governance, all of those oversighting is audit committee. Performance is based on a concept called as a balanced scorecard. We look into a sample of that as well, right? Internal controls as per COSO, very important question. Five components as per COSO. You are not look into very, very detail, but at a high level, you should be aware of it. This is also reflected in SA 315. What is COSO? What is a framework? See, framework is an umbrella or a pillar or a border based upon which your growth, wherever it goes, it will still support you. It will not help you to fall off that particular frame, right? That's the whole purpose of a framework within which you operate. Now, in governance framework, there are multiple things. One is COSO, COBIT, ISO. Now, what we're going to do is COSO. COSO has got five broad, uh, you know, pillars, right? And it has 17 principles for each of them. And that is what you notice over here. The first one is called as a control environment, right? It could also be referred to as the framework it's called as a COSO cube. First one is called as a control environment. Control environment is in short, 
the policies, the organization setup, the way ethics are looked into, all of those are control environment. Now, from there, it comes one level down, risk assessment. Am I assessing the risk? Right? How am I assessing the risk? What is the periodicity? Am I doing some sort of a, a simple thing like, you know, setting up a periodical scan of vulnerabilities, setting up a periodical checks and balances? That's basically a risk assessment, right? So am I doing a risk assessment to identify where the issue is? Control activities. For the identified risk, what is the control mechanism? I repeat, for the identified risk, what is the control mechanism? And that's basically called control activity. Once you have the control activity, you have what is called information and communication. Information and communication. Now, what is communication? This refers to, I have a beautiful control, but I am not disseminating or not informing anybody. What is the purpose? Right? I may have the best of the control. I may have something which is best with me. I'm not communicating. What is the point? Right? So information and communication. Last is monitoring activities. What is monitoring activities? Periodical verification, example, internal audit, right? Doing a due diligence or a check, right? So that's periodical verification. So these are the five pillars based on which the course of and this course of framework has got a three-dimensional cube. One is this what you see. The other is what is you see on a columnar perspective. This can be deployed across the entity level. That means a simple example. Across a company, this is what how I implement it. Right, or it could be across a division only for a division, or it could be only for an operating unit, or it could be only for a function, finance, uh, IT, whatever it is. It could be only for those, and this can be useful for three things: operational purposes, reporting purposes, or compliance purposes. And that is where the course of framework is. What to expect in examination? They will give a particular scenario and they'll ask you to fit it within these three or four pillars. Exam, an organization did not have any policies or SOPs as a result of which, whatever, there were many findings or there was a fraud. Which of the following elements did the organization fail to achieve as per the course of framework? It is control and right? Another examination. An organization had policies which were regularly updated. However, it was noted that the users were never aware of the policy. Which of the COSO pillars did they fail at? Information and communication. I hope you got an idea how the questions could be asked, right? Next thing. According to COSO, I think I already mentioned, these are the five things we already discussed. I'm not spending too much time. Quickly jumping guns into coming to COBIT 5. COBIT 5 is there in the old syllabus. COBIT 2019 is there in the new syllabus, right? Please be very, very clear, right? Revised version. So those of you who are listening now should only be the new syllabus stakeholders. First, sorry, old syllabus stakeholders, right? COBIT 5, what is COBIT 5? It is the only governance framework which covers end-to-end -end of a IT setup, right? It's a governance framework exclusively on IT, right? So now what is it or how does it matter? So you have five principles of COBIT. The first principle being meeting the stakeholders. Need. What whom, whose need am I meeting? Let's take a simple example for anything on governance. My suggestion is you think of the GST department, GST website, right? It has its own pros and cons. It has come fairly way ahead, but think of that. I think you should be able to answer this. Meeting the stakeholders need. Was on July 1st when the GST was implemented, was the website or the department or whoever it is, were they able to meet the stakeholder needs? The stakeholder needs are multiple. Right? So how do I achieve that? That is basically point number one. I'm not asking you whether they met or not. I'm talking about a perspective. Second, covering the enterprise end to end. That means all the aspects you have to cover. It is not just that only for a purpose I'm using it. The multiple purpose I need to cover it. Right? C, use a single integrated framework, which is a COBIT 5, which you use as a single integrated. Four, enable a holistic approach. You know, right from the end to end process and look at the inclusive approach. And last, very important, governance and management have to be separated, right? And there's a beautiful diagram which says the relationship. Look from the left to the right. The stakeholders or owners give the, delegate the power to the governing body. Who's the governing body? Board of directors. Board of directors give a direction to the management. Who's the management? CEO, CFO. The management instruct and align to the operation and execution. Now, operation and execution report management management whatever they do is monitored by governing body 
governing body is accountable for stakeholders get this relationship expect questions on interchange of this right owners and stakeholders dash to the governing body delegate accountable set direction monitor right so those are possibilities which you can expect in this particular niche and this is where the governance and management give a clear distinction right governance is always to do with edm and what is edm evaluate direct monitor edm and what is management plan build run monitor please note i am not doing a full fledged hobbit related discussion that's probably of <clears throat> Three to four hours discussion, but in the interest of time, I'm just trying to restrict it to what is most important. Seven enablers of Hobbit Five. Please, please, please remember this. What we saw in three or four slides. Please remember. In fact, I've taken the most important points only on this slide. Probably my entire slide alone may probably consist of one twenty to one thirty marks. Only my slide, right? Whatever is a one twenty to one thirty marks. Maybe I. I mean, I cannot make an estimate or a guess, guess estimate sort of a thing. But probably a good portion is definitely covered, right? What are the enablers of COVID? First, anything if you have to implement, you require seven people or seven fellows to help you out, right? So it is said that you know when a man dies or a woman dies, right? Seven foot, six to seven foot is what is ultimately has to be. So think in those lines. The first one is PPF, principle, policy, framework. The second is processes. A principle policy framework is you want to implement something. There should have been a principle or a policy. A principle is ease of doing business. A policy is how do you enforce it. A framework is a broad pillar. Then processes. How is that getting translated? Third is an organization structure. Who reports to whom? How hierarchy, etc. Fourth is CEB, culture, ethics, behavior. Right. So whenever you want to do things right, you need to set the culture right. Example: You have set a policy in your organization. This time, you know people should not come, and you yourself are not adhering to the entire ethics behavior fails. Right. Then you have information. Information is all about data. Right. How are you dealing with it? Then you have services, applications, infrastructure. Right. Your apps. Your software, whatever is being used, and lastly, the people skill and competency. Now, remember this from a GST context; you'll be able to recollect. Let's say the GST website was being developed, and you were, as an advisor, you had to give it the principles, policy, and framework. What does the government want? What is the policy? What is the framework? Second is, you know, have they informed a policy? Have they informed a process? Process within emphasis, process within finance ministry, process within state GST, central GST, finance department, etc. Organization structure: who reports to whom? What is the culture and ethics? How is the information dealt with? Right? Is the app available? Is the service available? Is the infra available? Last is the people skills and competencies. What happens to COVID nine? Right? What happens to COVID nine? Remember, there were this five principles. These five principles are now translated into six principles here. Right? So that is something which is slightly different. Provide stakeholder value, holistic compliance, dynamic governance system, distinction of government from governance from management, tailored to enterprise needs, end to end. Right, and the principles continue to be three in terms of the governance framework based on conceptual model, open and flexible, aligned to standard. Right? Is not whatever you see COVID two thousand nineteen applicable only, only, only for new syllabus, right? And this is basically in terms of execution, understanding the enterprise, understanding what is the scope, define the system, and conclude, right? And this is what is called as a COVID core model, right? The core model of the COVID, which has which was taken inputs from COVID five, COVID core. Was basically these four processes which you see. There is something called design factors, and based on which you can try and make your enterprise governance system, right? And this is how the entire setup works. ISO twenty seven thousand one common topic: information security management stand. It is also a framework. The difference between this and COBIT is ISO twenty seven thousand one is useful only from a security perspective, and it's a management standard. Whereas COBIT is a governance standard. I hope you're getting the difference, right? So management is basically how you are executing it. Governance is more of the strategy, top notch. First, second, ISO twenty seven thousand focus only on security, right? Only on security. Whereas a COBIT is much beyond. It is a governance standard on enterprise IT, right? And if you look into the ISO, the first It's basically a standard. It has class one, two, three, which talks about scope, normative references, etc. Four, five, six, whatever is there, you can notice this. And towards the end, you have an annexure which has hundred and fourteen controls, based on which an organization uh, controls that become a framework which they have to implement. Then you have what is called thirty-eight five hundred. This is basically governance. ISO standard for governance of IT, evaluating the current and future use of IT. Again, you could relate it with COBIT. You'll be able to answer it. 
ISO 31000, it's basically a risk framework or risk management standard, principally evolved from Australia and the New Zealand standard, right? Very, very important examination exam, examination question. What are the matrices of an effective risk management? Percentage of critical processes covered by risk assessment. Number of significant IT related incidents not identified in risk assessment are now getting identified. Percentage of enterprise risk, including IT risks, are failing or you know are able to adhere to. Frequency of updating of risk profile. All these are few matrices. If there is a positive connotation, that means it is good. If there's a negative connotation, that means it's a failure. And then you have the SOX requirement, SOX, which is basically uh, you know the Sarbanes Oxley Act, which was passed in the US, where the CEO, CFO will be held criminally liable if there is an internal control failure. In India, the SOX requirement comes in the form of IEFC, internal financial controls. DSA 2.0, you don't have internal financial controls. DSA 3.0, you have a concept of internal financial controls. IEFC, section 143 of the Companies Act, read with section 134 of the Companies Act. Right. Again, old syllabus, you have concept of clause 49. New syllabus clause 49 is replaced by LODR regulations, listing obligation, listing obligation, uh, LODR listing obligation disclosure requirements. Right. The essence of it is basically speaking on internal control certification. Right. And there's a clause 49 requirement, which is translated in LODR regulations currently. Right. For examination, difference between governance and management, governance, evaluate, direct, monitor. Right, so EDM, right? Whereas management, plan, build, run, align, achieve, monitor, right? Correct. So that's how it is. Management reports are responsible to governance, and governance is basically more of board of directors. Okay. In this chapter, very very important, my dear friends, both new and old. There are a lot of roles and responsibility based questions which will come. The roles and responsibility based questions. The first thing is IT strategy committee. Please note IT strategy committee. So this is the committee. Okay, first and foremost, the word committee means representative of directors. One at least one director should be there, one or two directors. Only then we call it as a committee. Otherwise, we just form it as an internal name, whatever. Is it, IT strategy committee. The moment we say strategy committee, this is the committee which decides from the governance how the next steps should be taken. How the next step should be taken, right? A high-level plan. Okay, invest in this, invest in that, all of those. That is a strategy committee. One level below the strategy committee is the steering committee. The steering committee is the committee, very important examination question, who decides the long term and the short term plan. It is this committee which decides where should I make the investments. For example, the strategy committee will give the budgets and say, okay, high level, you focus on automation of your process. Which process should automate? Department A will say my, my new automate. Department B will say my new automate. Who decides that? Steering committee, long term, short term plan. Right? So that's the steering committee. Your system administrator, very important fellow. He is the guy who gives access to other users. Examination question. An IS auditor was reviewing the failed login attempt. Which of the following users failed login attempt, if indicated maximum, is a cause of concern? Means what? You are doing an audit. Right, there is a log report called as failed login register. What is meaning of failed login register, sir? You entered sir, username, password. Your username and password you entered incorrectly. So, what is the meaning of that? That means you are not able to log in. Every time such thing happens, your name will appear there. This user this time tried to log in, it did not happen. That's all. Now I take that entire dump. I just do a filter. Whose username is appearing many times there? One of the person's name is system administrator. Now, if a system administrator's account is being multiple times saying that account lockout are not working, what is the meaning of it? It means either system administrator is forgetting. I mean, that is not the case. Somebody else is trying to log in with the help of system user ID, system administrator account. So if the system administrator account gets compromised, it is the highest risk. Why? He is the guy who can give access to every other person. Right? He is the guy who can create a user, delete a user. Right. So that means if a system administrator account is compromised, that is the highest risk for an auditor. So the answer would be system administrator. Next is network administrator. His role is very simple. Monitor the overall network. Who can join the network? Who cannot join the network? Verifying, you know, deploying, etc. One of the other question, business uh, uh, balance scorecard as a as a management, right? It can be used for monitoring, measuring, management, direction setting. Which are the following cases where business 
scorecard cannot be used right they'll give these three words and some other word right so monitoring measurement management direction it's a simple example it will speak from a financial angle how it is viable for the shareholders from an internal process angle it will measure from a customer angle it will talk from a satisfaction and learning and growth angle it will measure this is more like you know those matrices we speak of like you know bcg uh, you know porter's five four two model and things like that. one of the models is balance I'll pause a minute here if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll go to the a very, very interesting and a very important chapter, Protection of Information. Are you all good? <clears throat> all right. So now I'm quickly jumping guns and moving a little ahead because we need to discuss protection of information assets. The protection of information assets, very important chapter because in this entire chapter, we are broadly talking about A, what is asset, what is information asset, all those things are self-explanatory, I didn't bother. There is a repetition of concept of risk, causes of risk, sources of risk, inherent risk. Again, I'm not repeating it, but very important, there is roles and responsibilities again in this chapter and I'll spend directly with that. Custodian. Custodian is the guy under whose responsibility an asset is. You want a garment or a churidar or a shirt to be stitched, you are giving your fabric or your cloth to the tailor. He is the custodian. You have a jewelry, you have the jewelry, you are keeping in a bank locker. The bank manager is the custodian. Come to IT world. You have data, all branches have the data stored in the data center. Data center is the custodian. Clear of this? But then, if I want to give access, he is the guy who will give me access, but he is not the guy who will approve access. Example, your jewelry is in the bank locker and I am an auditor of your organization and I'm saying, hey, I want to see the jewelry. The bank manager is the guy who will help me out. But first question he'll ask me is, who are you? I can say I'm the auditor, all those stories. He will say, sir, please get a letter from my client or, you know, from you saying that you are so-and-so person. Then I will go ahead and do it. That means he is taking owner's permission, right? Who is the owner? Information custody we spoke of, system owner. System owner is the guy who has to approve or give permission for the access. How does it translate into digital way, right? You are accessing, you are a company like as you just start up or whatever, right? You are one of the employees who have joined one small department in finance, just doing accounting interests. Now for you to get access to their application, two people have to approve. First, whoever is your immediate boss, he has to approve because only he knows you are his report. First. Second, the person who is the owner of the application has to approve. Owner of the application has to approve, right? Go back to my example of jewelry. Who's the owner? You are the owner, right? You, you have to approve it. Only then, which is the IT department, will give access. Very clear? So system owner is the guy, the foremost responsibility of system owner is to decide what level of security has to be implemented. That is system owner. Custodian is only to implement as well as safekeeping. In a digital world, you also has to do regular backups, routine checkups, etc. Right. So this roles, responsibility, custodian and owner, very, very important favorite examination question. Right? Next, user manager, I told you, I report to Mr. X or Y, that person is the user manager. Super user, he is a fellow who has superior access. Why superior access? It could be an admin account, right? It has the highest level of authorization, etc. Then there's also a small concept in this chapter called as risk relating to external parties. Now, what is risk relating to external parties? Now, your organization or data, third party may have access. He may be an auditor, he may be a vendor, he may be a customer. What is the risk pertaining to? That's what we're looking into. Classical example, Air India's data access was given to one of Air India's vendor. That vendor has a, had a breach. As a result, Air India had to apologize. I hope you get that example. This was a few years back. And maybe a, a year or two years back, right? So what you need to do, what is the type of access given, how the physical restriction, logical restriction, sensitivity involved, what are the key functions, you know, a bunch of those things. You know, concept called BYOD, bring your own device. Basically, employees are given the flexibility to bring their own personal devices to office, 
right, to use it. But what is the risk? The risk is ANDI, A N D I, application risk, device risk, network risk, implementation risk. Application risk is what? Because I use it in a mobile phone, right, or this app. That app may have multiple vulnerabilities. Device risk. What if the device gets stolen? Network risk. I don't know who is coming into my network and who is going out of my network, right? Implementation. There could be practical challenges. Examination as question. Next, concept of classification. Classification refers to deciding which is more precious to you and not precious to the, uh, in terms of value. Simple example, in inventory, we use a concept called ABC analysis. What is an ABC? A is highest value, least in terms of quantity. C is highest in terms of quantity, least in terms of value. Quite similar to that, you classify your information. Now, what is an example? Your tally data may be highly confidential. Your win, your win clear tax or your income tax data may be highly confidential. Whereas your um, probably your billing information, your billing information to which client, how much you're going to bill may not be very confidential. So it may be something which is sensitive or your salary data may be sensitive. So you're bucketing the asset based on multiple classifications. You're bucketing the asset based on multiple classification. And the advantage of you doing the classification, my dear friends, is very, very simple. When you classify the advantages, you know what level of control you need to apply. Failure to identify or failure to classify is a big risk, right? So that is classification. Backup media, online, offline media, all of those are examples, right? Now, classification are broadly into four types, five, four or five types, right? Secret, very, very sensitive. For example, only two or three people in an organization will know about it. For example, the way in which Pepsi or Coke is made, the way in which Kingfisher beer is made, top secret. Confidential, restricted set of people. Sensitive, slightly more but you don't want to reveal it. An example could be a listed company's results could be confidential. A merger and demerger strategy could be top secret. A financial data, salary information could be sensitive. Internal could be memos, formats, etc. Public is annual reports, right? So each of them have different level of security and that's the purpose of classification. One of the examination asked question, what is the purpose of classification of data? The purpose of classification is to decide Rich risk each of the type of data consists of and what is the control I need to apply. Otherwise, I cannot say everything you have to encrypt, everything you have to have restricted access. No, it may not be possible, right? Next, the chapter also explains three things, physical controls, environmental controls, logical controls, and network controls. So when you speak of these four controls, we also have to speak of the risk relating to that. A few examples of physical controls is, first understand what is the physical risk. The physical risk is somebody can go and damage something. You are having some access and somebody goes and damages that as simple as that, right? A laptop, somebody can go damage physically. So anything which can happen physically, what are the controls? Biometric, video camera, ID cards, manual logging, all of those. Now, what type of examination question you can ask? You could expect a question on preventive, question on detective, question on corrective, etc. Example, if you see these images, which of these controls is, which of the controls is detective control? All the controls which you see is preventive except CCTV camera. CCTV camera is always detective. Why? By installing a CCTV camera, can you prevent something? If something happens, you can detect. No doubt CCTV camera acts like a deterrent. You are being watched, etc. People feel a little cautious. But CCTV camera is always a detective control, not a preventive control. Right? Again, another examination asked question concept of false positive versus false negative or a false acceptance. False positive is a simple example is you are logging into a system. You are an authorized user, but system is not allowing you because in a biometric, you're scanning it. For some reason, it says rejected. False positive. That means you are supposed to go in, but it is not allowing you to go. False positive. Okay. But what is a bigger risk? False negative. That means a person who does not have access is being given access. That's called false negative, right? So which among the following is the most risky for a biometric? The answer is false negative. That means even if it is false or it is negative case, it is giving you an acceptance or a clearance, right? So please be very, very careful. False and negative. That means the result should have been a negative, but that is showing us false. That means it's showing us positive. Are you clear? Other factors, enrollment time, throughput rate, and which of the following biometrics 
has the highest or rejection rate or the least acceptance fingerprint voice etc the answer would be retina scan imagine every time you log in you have to open your eyes and scan obviously you are having a you know a, a resistance to it so that's basically what it is yeah when it comes to physical security or environmental security one more popular question is humidity humidity is nothing but the amount of water vapor or water content in the air simple example mumbai chennai or you know kolkata all these things are towards the beach seashore humidity level is high higher the humidity higher the corrosion lesser the humidity higher the static electricity are we clear with this high humidity causes high corrosion low humidity causes high static electricity expect questions on this interchange okay right? next power degradation there are four types of power degradation power excess huge power power loss no power right a power excess could be temporary or permanent spike is temporary surge is for a longer time power loss fault or blackout fault is temporary blackout is for a long point in time this is power loss not low power right the low power is what you see in the next slide for degradation sag for some few seconds the power came down or brownout you know it is prolonged for a lower this thing i'm sure all of you would have experienced this then is inrush current inrush current is typically when your power goes off and ups turns on your fan runs a little faster that's because of inrush there is so much power stored suddenly i'm pushing that so that is basically called as an inrush are we clear with this these are just a few examples for your reference the question fire suppression fire suppression is based on the types of fire a b c d a is caused based on uh, you know wood paper b is based on liquid petrol c is electrical and d is because of combustible materials chemicals etc so for b which is liquid oriented you need to compulsory use a foam right other methods are also possible right now another question which may ask is uh, i think it is there suppression systems what are the three types of suppression systems wet pipe dry pipe pre action what is wet pipe water is continuously running i repeat water is continuously running and you will switch on the water when there is a fire that means it is just like immediately it will stop because there is a water already there it just that the pipe will open but it is highly risky because water is continuously moving possibility of leakage system gets damaged dry pipe most acceptable and therefore examination answer right there is a pipe only when there is a disaster you press the button and then the water starts moving right so that's right then gas based suppression you have halon and carbon dioxide both of them are halon is currently banned you cannot use it at all carbon dioxide and some variants are there you can use that but again if it is unmanned territory only that means human beings are not there if human beings are there obviously you know this can cause bigger damage to human next when it comes to logical access path this is an example of where all attacks can happen a user is logging into a computer right i am logging into my system there is an access point my system or my mobile is accessing my network there is an access point my network is logging into the application software that means my network and application software has to speak with each other application software has to speak with data so all the layers there is an access and therefore there is a possibility of an attack the user has to access operating system with the help of username password user system has to access the network with the help of a valid wifi connection network connection etc the network has to access the application therefore application permissions have to be given and the application has to access the database database permissions have to be given so what are the issues when it comes to logical access a few examples what is logical access instead of physically accessing you are virtually accessing right spoofing faking right suddenly you you know you have seen in social media that somebody pretends to be somebody else right spoofing dumpster diving simple attack where somebody tries to go through the dustbin to get useful information right dustbin meaning it could be physical dustbin or it could be deleted files right that's why we say shift delete don't just do a normal delete next phishing is something which all of us are aware of right attempting to acquire sensitive information by pretending or concealing the fact that you are a cheat rather you are saying that you are you know sort of creating a fake website or a fake link saying you know urgent action if you don't change your password now you are not be able to access and things like that now the phishing has got two variants wishing and smishing wishing is over phone call hello we are calling from icic bank please send these details smishing you get a sms you click a link and you fall for it, right that's a smishing 
piggy backing simple example door kept open you entered behind you another person came right that's a piggy backing it happens in a physical or a logical method physical i gave you an example logical how you are browsing you forgot to log out an application the next time you log, come into the application or you come to the browser somebody can actually log in right that's piggy backing social engineering i told you it's a variant of phishing social engineering is the most difficult to prevent they can ask you which of the following attacks is most difficult to prevent to so the social engineering. social engineering the only solution which you can do is awareness only awareness and please note in all the slides i mentioned one last line what is the control right next is malicious code the malicious code are these are codes which are causing damage into your system right virus is an example which basically tries to damage your system which can copy information and share it with others do some sort of a damage worm it duplicates itself worm what does it do duplicates itself sometimes you open a file one file has attachment to this file or shortcut to this file etc trojan horse it can take your information and send it to somebody else logic bomb logic bomb is a something accidentally you deleted a file accidentally you deleted a file as a result the system actually fails now there is another variant of logic bomb called as a time bomb it will explode on a particular time when i say an explode it is not physically explode it will make your system become more and more slower this happened in earlier china model phones so after 6 months a logic a time bomb will explode thereby your phone becomes slow right and therefore you will invariably go and surrender that phone and buy a new phone macro viruses all these are again variants of virus polymorphic virus hidden virus polymorphic stealth all these things are hidden virus and then you have adware and spyware adware is basically sometimes your browser settings changes the moment you download some software why and they keep on sending you advertisements they keep on tracking you those are adware and spyware spyware they keep on spying you right one of the examination as question which of the following is not a type of an attack right they may give you all these options one of the option could be a logic bomb because logic bomb strictly is not a type of an attack because you did something mischievous or you deleted some file as a result that logic stop your right so that's a way in which you should look at it next is a concept of botnet now what is a botnet botnet is nothing but a collection a robot network robot network a simple example is like this there is a hacker hacker is collect connecting a few computers and through this computers he is having access to all of this computers and all of these computers i will send a message they will start attacking a website it all a simple example all of these fellows start visiting the income tax website so what happens or gst website and we already know only 135000 session uh, users can parallelly log into a gst website right so that's where everybody goes in attack right so that's an example of a botnet next so what are the possible attacks on passwords brute force somebody trying to use multiple combination of password and trying to attack say for example abc abc at the rate one abc at the rate two abc at the rate three brute force dictionary you have a dictionary use the same words and attack right trojan he copies your password and sends it spoofing trying to be some fake or something piggy backing we all these spoof right so this could also be an examination question which of the following type of attack is a compromise using a password or is an attack on the login password they'll give you three options of this and fourth something else right now what are the controls for this the controls is first is user management who has access how am i giving access the entire thing second is defining responsibilities like for example banks send you a message right you shall not share your password with anybody another thing so defining response third having access over network application database or operating system user management i think we already spoke of this user registration privilege management password management etc one very important examination question from this slide could be asked multi factor authentication or how authentication can happen through multiple means so authentication can happen through three methods one based on what you know example you know a password you know your date of birth you know your pin that is knows has what is it that you have you have a mobile that mobile will get a otp you have an email id that email id will get a otp you have let us say that um, uh, uh, you know very sign a token on that you can get a otp all these things are has and last is is what is it something about you for example your voice your retina your fingerprint right so all the biological features comes there so what you know what you have who you are if i use any of these combinations that could be a multi factor authentication an example could be which of the following is a combination of what you know and what you have right the answer is d and g what is d bank and bank card and pin and g identification badge with photograph with associate password right in fact g is i think a common between all of them but i hope you got an idea
single sign on this is an interesting method the method used for authentication what it does is it enables users not to remember multiple usernames and password not to remember multiple usernames so if you have 10 usernames 20 usernames all those things it only becomes complicated so single sign on will ensure there is only one mechanism please not i am not saying all accounts will have same username and password no using the single sign on once if i log in all the applications it will work example if i log in through gmail maps will work google drive will work youtube will work all of those right so that is a single sign on right and this is done through two methods through an active directory or through an ldap last is risk pertaining to network and therefore you need to understand what are the risks when it comes to network first is anonymity you do not know who does what automation many of them can be done automatically distance eliminates the distance right so you you do not know where it is opaqueness you don't know who is actually doing for all you know here in my zoom app there might be some person called as mr a and mr y i don't know who these people are right opaqueness last is routing diversity i can route my traffic across various channels what are the threats and vulnerabilities when it comes to network first information gathering a simple example if i have to identify something about a person i can gather information about that person through various means searching on the internet searching on the wifi browser and other right example 2 you go to a hotel you switch on your wifi you can see the various wifi profiles all these are examples of information gathering communication of system vulnerabilities right communicating to somebody that hey my system is having some failure that's another example protocol fall, flaws protocol flaws is that the method of communication itself has a failure example zoom many years back was using an unencrypted communication therefore anybody can probably log in a protocol flaw impersonation trying to pretend somebody else message confidentiality that confidentiality of the messages altered message integrity all of those website defacement bringing down the website putting some malicious information denial of service you want to access a website but there is so much traffic coming onto the website you are not able to access the traffic may be a legitimate or a illegitimate traffic right so with that we come to the end of this chapter 4 of new syllabus or you can call it a chapter a, a chapter uh, basically on the uh, chapter 3 uh, yeah protection of information assets any questions over here probably take a minute otherwise i will jump into the next topic what is the difference between logical and network access control very good question logical access network control is also a type of a logical access control first only difference is network is done over a long range right network is done over a long range a simple example using a wifi you do it anything which impacts using a network connectivity right a logical access is a comprom is the first level is a compromise on passwords compromise on systems why lo logical and network in fact if you see network is a part of the logical system why they did a segregation was in the world in which we are living earlier we were all living in an intranet world that means within an organization so logical access was focused only within an organization what are the possible attacks but then when vpns open connectivity started there is a possibility of an external also coming and attacking and that's where a network related control comes both of them are types of this that's where it comes difference between a virus and a worm virus is something which will either steal your information try to do some damage any malicious activity it will do worm normally does not do a malicious thing it will duplicate itself multiple times say for example your pen drive when you're using sometimes it will say a folder right next to it it will say shortcut to this folder you double click that folder again it will say shortcut to this folder you double click it will keep on going that it go in loops so it will create multiple worms right in case you remember this movie where there was this rajinikanth movie called as robot one robot created multiple robots that's a worm that's a worm attack if you see very carefully in one of the scenes he says demagnetizing worms go back to the movie and see not now after your examination is over yeah worm can duplicate on its own virus needs some sort of an action yes worm will keep on duplicating virus it doesn't need to do an action virus what it can do is it will take your information and transmit to somebody else it will impact the processing speed of your system it will do some sort of an damage to your system whereas worm normally may not do a damage it will just keep on creating copy paste and versions right in the interest of time i'll quickly move ahead and this is an interesting one a very small topic and it's called a system development life cycle what is the system development life cycle system development life cycle is nothing but 
the way in which you develop the entire system end to end right now why do you have to develop a system a simple example why did you have to come up with a new gst software because the old law was changed outdated or you can also argue hey why did i have to update my gst software because there are new changes in the gst software it means when will a system development place in two scenarios when the existing system is unable to meet the requirements or b there is a newer requirement right so that's a system development but what is the one of the things which you have to understand what are the challenges faced in a system development life cycle the first thing is lack of senior management support that means they will not give you the required support right so they will not bother they'll say okay a priority is not given and things like that. second shifting user needs user says first to do this then later on he says some do something more and after that again he brings something new the user needs are changing right and many a times when you develop a strategic system they are unstructured in nature that means they don't form form a proper structure newer technologies no standard methodology right you might construct it different that fellow might construct it different overworked or under trained staff right typically it happens in our own offices some employees or including yourself are overworked whereas the junior staff may probably be under trained they may not be doing it resistance to change the biggest thing Right? If you take any of the top-notch companies, also this resistance to change is the biggest thing. Right? Lack of user participation. Now he will not tell what all is required. After everything is over, he will say, "Hey, system is not working." Right? You ask them, you never told this is the requirement. So those are issues. Inadequate testing and user training. Again, system development life cycle. Remember our GST website. You'll be able to easily answer it. You will get all of those concepts. Right? So there are basically. seven phases in the system development life cycle and that starts with starts off with pi preliminary investigation system analysis design development testing implementation and post implementation review high level these are the things and by the way this entire chapter on system development is e learning in 2.0 in 3.0 it is a normal chapter and it covers two things one is called as approaches to system development and one more is system development so these are two broad things which you'll cover right and you have a last concept of secure system development life cycle which I invariably i'll cover it the preliminary investigation or the first stage what do you do as i said you don't have a system you want to develop or you have a older or faulty system therefore it requires improvisation so it is determine or analyze the strategic benefits to implement a system so that you avoid a future cost normally you do what is called as a feasibility study what is feasibility study evaluation of alternatives cost benefit analysis etc right what are the angles in which you do a feasibility study these are the angles which is a memory code called lobster f and is don't bother about memory code but here you need to understand what each of them are first technical feasibility is the hardware software technology all of this relevant or not example if i want to communicate i use a coaxial cable i do have to use a fiber optic computer program do i have to buy a new program do i have to independent independently develop or in house input medium ocr character etc transaction processing real time batch processing now another could be format right if you let take an example earlier uh, service tax department wanted xml now your gst department wanted i think um, what is that format uh, uh, the some other format it's not uh, occurring to me at this point in time there was xml right so all of these formats keep on changing that's another example economic feasibility what is an economic feasibility thank you thank you it's json format thank you just suddenly slipped my mind economic feasibility economic feasibility is cost and benefit right hardware software what is the cost if i don't change anything i leave it as it is what happens right cost of not changing anything operation maintenance cost intangible cost right all of those next comes your element of operational feasibility what is operational feasibility do i get support from management what happens if there is a loss of control change management right all of those are operational feasibility then you have schedule feasibility what happens whether this this can i do it within one month two months six months right legal feasibility am i legally permitted to is there any license restrictions resources do i have the enough employees skilled workers training required and behavioral could there be any adverse impact input output availability and things like that so that's basically behavior the phase 2 is system analysis in system analysis based on information in phase 1 you draw further information right you define formal lines of authority you define sops you see how the information flows right you try to see whether there is a possibility of it right and here you do multiple fact finding techniques for example you review documents you review questionnaires ask questions observations and there are various tools which you use like a flow chart diagrams etc once it is done you go to system design system design is more like an architecture so it's like see you are constructing a house right think you are constructing a house you will be able to get everything one by one how constructing a house first 
you are deciding whether to go for a house or not that is prelim now that you have decided now what all you want in your house that is your analysis now design somebody comes and says hey blueprint use the specification gives a physical layout create a blueprint it could be something like this logical design blueprint physical design how each devices work what is the input output format what are the features what are the controls so here you are actually structuring everything for example the gate has to be east facing north facing vastu compliant whatever you have a bunch of stories all of those you go ahead and define and then comes system development and acquisition right now that you have done all of this question is whether you want to go and acquire an existing property or you want to system develop an existing property right you want to start from scratch so build the system to the design specifications so here very important is you need to define what is called as the acquisition standard security reliability functionality what is the vendor how do i contact the vendor what is the software right now here you'll also define you will go for a rfp request for quotation what should be the qualification of the vendor again relate everything with the property construction or with your gst website you'll be able to identify that. acquisition how do i acquire the hardware is there a support for the hardware right do i purchase the software on my own is there support available in house acquired copyrights etc again there could be advantages and disadvantages features of ready made versus in house what you see on this slide is a few advantages and disadvantages as well as the features right so each of them has its own share of good as well as the bad then comes phase 5 system testing very very popular area of questions comes from system testing the system testing the purpose is very simple it is not to say that the system is without defects it is only to say that hey there are some defects present so that's basically system testing right so what are the types of testing and here you do multiple types the first type of testing is called unit testing unit testing refers to an independent test testing done by the programmer i repeat independent testing done by the programmer the programmer who is the fellow who's designed it he does the testing right and when we do it what is a unit unit is the smallest component of the system let's take an example income tax software you are developing and you are develop only income from salary head that could be a simple example of a unit testing now here this unit test could have multiple types functional test you check whether the income from salary is computed as per the logic given are they doing what they are supposed to do functional performance is it doing quickly or very very slow manually i took 5 minutes system is taking 10 minutes stress test everybody try to log in overload the system see whether it works or not structural test see if i give the right logic if i change the logic what happens right such so a structure one after the other and last is parallel test you do it in the old system as well as new system see both of them are the same tests then this unit testing can also have two types static analysis and dynamic static analysis is desk check that means you're sitting in the same place checking the syntax doing a walk through doing a code inspection all of those are static analysis you have dynamic testing black box white box and gray box black box is what you give the input you check the output that's all you give the input you take the output that means you don't go to the processing logic based on the input and output you verify that's called black box simple way to remember black box you remember the concept of black hole right you cannot see anything which is inside the black hole but you can see what is surrounding it surrounding it input and output white box inside you take an internal perspective gray box is a combination next once you are done with unit testing you do what is called as an integration testing simple example income from house property i did income from salary i did both of them independently working if i merge both of them will it work together integration testing modules are combined and tested as a group occurs after unit testing regression testing most popular examination question your income from house property you brought in right after you brought in salary now after you bought income from house property what was earlier working fine no stopped working i repeat what was earlier working fine stopped working so the recent test ensures that the changes or corrections have not introduced a new type of errors have not introduced new type of errors and that's called integration testing and then you have system testing do an entire holistic approach software hardware people process everything put together you may probably test that's called system testing this system again testing has got four types recovery testing if there is a failure is the system able to recover crash testing what are you can call security testing all confidentiality integrity available to others 
then you have stress or volume testing what is stress or volume all of them again attack the system at the same time or rather use the system at the same time is it able to handle the stress last performance testing what is the speed at which it is operated please note here you will find system testing slightly similar to that of unit testing but that is tested as a small this is tested as a whole right then you have what is called as final acceptance testing it's a more of a clearance testing this is the last step of the entire testing process now here there are two types quality assurance user acceptance user acceptance has got two things alpha beta alpha is done internally by the organization within the organization beta is done by external that is why you see beta version is available for testing any of the gst forms they release also first they release a beta version people are expected to test it's another matter people may not go test that's other part of story next phase is implementation now that you have done the test it now you have to put it into life please bear in mind we use the word implementation and not installation why installation is double click implementation is lot of things income tax website you can again relate it with the implementation old data is to get migrated convert the format you need to train the users right there is a system change over all of those things now this strategy is of four types the first method is direct implementation gst website july 1st new website prior to that old website so direct or up Second phase, slowly remove the old and move into the new. When banks went to core banking, they went to a phase two. But before phase, they went for a pilot. Test with two or three. If it works, then do this. Please bear in mind, pilot after a pilot, you may either go for a phase or you may go for a direct. Your choice, right? And last is parallel. Use the old also. Use the new also for some point in time. That's basically called parallel. Then comes the last step: post implementation review and maintenance. this is all about did i achieve what i'm supposed to achieve right post implementation you develop you evaluate the develop you evaluate the operation you evaluate the schedule a uh, overall check and then comes maintenance examination as question the different types of maintenance exercise first is called as scheduled maintenance it is more like on this day i will go the system will not work it's anticipated in advance simple example irctc website every day 11:30 pm to 12:30 am is a scheduled maintenance they will it will not, you cannot book a ticket try it out rescue maintenance rescue maintenance is there something as an emergency you have to rescue it that comes as an emergency then you have corrective maintenance maybe there was something which is a correction you identified and you want to fix it but it is not so very urgent so therefore you don't come for a rescue right then you have adapt maintenance what is adapt to maintenance income tax form changed gst form changed as a result i am updating it adaptive perfective maintenance you are adding a new feature adding a new requirement right maybe user suggested or you felt you know uh, doing the 2a and 3b comparison right so that could be a perfect maintenance preventive maintenance again aim to improvise the performance and other things preventive maintenance is sometimes also a scheduled maintenance if it is put in as part of the schedule now comes the next part of this entire chapter the models or the approaches to system development life cycle the first model is called as a waterfall model it's called as a linear model the seven stages which i spoke of one after the other i will do it will happen in such a way that the second will commence only after the completion of first third will commence only after the completion of second even if there is some sort of an overlap until the previous is completed i will not do it is called the waterfall model next is a prototype model here what i do you create a small variant it is like a model unit is created if you are okay i will go ahead and construct right so that's like a model and again it is slightly iterative so you saw a small you see, you see a baby version and you are suggest for changes modification etc okay? so you identify the requirements and you keep on doing and this model is called iterative model that means repeated you have prototype model right advantages and disadvantages i think we can discuss incremental model incremental model is a mini waterfall first income from salary first to last step execute second income from house property first to last step execute so you are doing everything multiple times but you keep on adding more and more features and that is what is called as an incremental model this is a combination of linear and iterative next is a spiral model spiral model is very very useful for large expensive complicated projects classical example gst but the problem is you will get lost especially on the timeline right so that is why the gst website even though it required it did not go for a spiral model because it will take forever to do it right so therefore that's an advantage as well as disadvantage next is a rapid rapid as it says rad 
minimal planning maximum rapid prototyping so you do it very very fast and quickly so here the focus is on fast delivery fast development that is your main focus rapid application development okay. and then is agile agile is build small build often small things build fast build quick that's basically this thing and here what you do in fact you bring the customer only to your place so customer you design you as the customer you design you as the customer so that sort of a method which works and this is the most important slide when to choose which this is what an examination question is a waterfall model is used when it is an inexperienced dream right you want a very very structure a prototype is advantage is a pilot version is much much ready and quick feedback incremental is decomposition that means you're dividing into smaller components then it is possible and there's a constant addition you keep on adding spiral model is large expensive complicated the limitation is the time rad quick and speedy minimal planning agile build small build often highest customer satisfaction are you clear so that brings us to the end of this section called as dlc which is your chapter number 5 in one of this open for questions before i move to the ultimate section right quickly look into business continuity planning agile model okay agile model is again quite similar to that of a rad model but here you do build small and build often sometimes you very closely integrate with the customer and both of you hand in glove do it. okay bcp business continuity planning this is chapter 7 of your uh, new uh, old syllabus uh, part governance in the content wise more or less is the same i'll focus on critical things these are all few examples of failure of it in the interest of time i'm not going too much into that related terms we already have looked into again i'm not discussing few other terms which you should be aware emergency management team the team which addresses all the emergency incident is any violation anything which leads to a war disruption services etc mbco very important minimum business continuity objective what are the minimum level of services you want in the event there is a disaster for example if there is a disaster after that what is the minimum thing you want right so whenever an organization is having a disaster the first thing they will try to do is achieve the mbc then they'll slowly come back into normal next mao minimal acceptable outage how long can you be without the system right in other words it can also be referred to as you know what is your how much is the maximum downtime you can probably right and here the very very two important words is rto and rpo and i'll go directly into it an attack happens now an attack happens at let's say 8:30 now how much of a data is lost that depends on when was the last time you took a backup if you have taken the backup at morning 8 o'clock and an attack happens today at 8 o'clock evening 12 hours data gone but if you are taking a backup every one hour that means we are only referring to 30 minutes to one hour data if you take every second millisecond there is no data loss the backwards is called as recovery point objective how much of a data loss are you okay to take it right so your backup strategy is based on rpo if your rpo is to be very very minimal you may probably back up every one hour or every minute or every second are you clear with this next no disaster occur how quickly do you want to get started with the services that is recovery time objective that means futuristic a disaster has occurred how much time within which you want to start? recovery time if you want it to be done immediately that means you need to have a mirror site where if this is down this should be on a disaster recovery site this is down that is on banks have that right you are okay with about 1 hour 2 hours then you go for a hot site what is a hot site everything is there data probably updated version should be put in or you may go to a warm site what is a warm site software hardware everything is there data alone is not or cold site only physical site is there 
only some equipments other you have to install everything and go ahead that is a rules so please bear in mind recovery time objective is after the disaster alphabetical order alphabetical order you have e first after that so before the disaster is point objective after the disaster is time objective next is a bcp manual there is nothing but a document which consists of actions which you need to take business impact analysis very very important how do you decide which process is more critical than the other by doing a bia bia is the first trigger point for you to analyze investors okay? and here you have three things business resumption planning how quickly i can resume operational recovery planning disaster recovery planning the technology element crisis management the overall coordination so this is just to give an example of the overall thing right bcm is very large within that is uh, business continuity within business continuity a small portion is disaster recovery right and this is typically your uh, incident response disaster plus bcp is your business continuity management now how do i develop a bcp right so these are a few steps do a bia that's the first step examination ask question which are the following is the first priority step in a bcp it's bia then comes risk assessment right many of them answer risk assessment no it is bia so bia then you do a risk assessment then you develop the bcp test it and right so right? what are the various methods of risk assessment you can look into it later how do i have training walk through scenarios etc this is a very nice chart to give you the flow what is an incident a small violation of policy a small breach does it become a disaster so that is where the clear definition should be when an incident becomes a disaster from disaster when it becomes a business continuity Now, what are a few recovery strategies? All of those are mentioned over here. Activating the plan, notifying the team leaders, etc. Self-explanatory. Now, disaster scenarios could be major, minor, trivial, catastrophic. If it is death, it is always catastrophic. Huge amount of loss could also be catastrophic. Major could be a fairly large amount of loss or loss of limb or loss of you know hand, leg, etc. Minor could be some sort of scratches. Trivial could be just an airline accident or scratch. now what is the impact of disaster it could be multiple thing financial service level gets impacted hr gets impacted you know your dependency on land van technology those things are not working your liabilities you may have to provide now this very important what are the various types of testing which can be done right to do what is called as a checklist based test or a you do what is called as a um, uh, a simulation test that's typically what a BC, uh, business continuity you do right and these are a few examples of contents of bcp plan again you can probably spend some time then go through it next important question in this chapter backup strategy there are two methods or there are few methods in which you can do the strategy first method is you record in both the places you record here also you record here also dual record now you decide the time gap between the recording that's your choice second periodic dumping of data periodic dumping of data you have put everything here copy all of them and save it here. most of us in our offices do that right we have an external hard disk copy all the data and keep it the third logging in input transaction only the inputs you capture so that the system can auto calculate it so wherever time stamp and other things are not necessary go for this logging input will happen only when time stamp is not necessary imagine your customer's bank account right only inputs you log in system disaster only the inputs you have backed up you run the inputs again and the system auto calculates with today's date whereas you have it run yesterday right not possible so wherever audit trails wherever system integrity is required this may not be work logging on the changes only incremental changes whatever is there you log again backup has got four methods full backup incremental backup differential backup mirror backup right ignore mirror backup because neck to neck it is full backup one every sunday i take the entire hard disk one copy backup that's called full backup everything advantage everything is with disadvantage more time more space second incremental backup whatever additions have taken place on a daily basis that only a backup that is incremental backup right then you have differential backup whatever additions have taken place ever since i last took the full backup is what i will do here ever since i last took the full backup incremental ever since the last backup meaning monday i took a full backup sunday i took a full backup monday only changes of monday i'm taking incremental tuesday only changes of tuesday i'm taking incremental wednesday if i take a differential backup i'll take monday tuesday wednesday right thursday again incremental i'm doing only thursday friday incremental i'm doing only friday saturday i'm doing differential 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. All the five will get covered. So differential is ever since I did the last full time. And uh, alternative sites, I think I already have spoken about cold site, warm site, and uh, hot site. The other thing is reciprocal arrangement. Reciprocal arrangement is my data with you, your data with me. What is the biggest risk in a reciprocal arrangement? My hardware and software may not be compatible. That's the biggest risk. Examination asks question. I think we all discussed on this cold, warm, hot site. Yeah, this is the most important slide for asking questions on RTO and RPO. Remember, RTO is always hot site, mirror site, warm site. RPO is all to do with backup. All to do with backup. Okay. Just another example for you to look into. Last is data vault. Data vault is basically a physical storage device where you're keeping the data, whatever is backed up, so that you know it is free from electromagnetic interference and whatever. And this can be an on-site or an off-site mechanism. And what are a few resilience tools? You always try to have fault tolerance system, right? You try to ensure that there's no single point of failure. Like internet connections, you have two. Why? One fails, the other can come. You don't have only one vendor providing the repair. If that fellow does not work, other things, right? So those are all called a system resilience tools. You also use what is called a RAID. RAID is a redundant array of inexpensive disk. It is parallelly where hard disk the data will get. Last is a service level agreement. It is the minimum level of services your vendor is supposed to provide. And this is achieved or verified through using reports like SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3, where a third party is verified. Right, so that's about business continuity. And now we are heading into module six of uh, new uh, old syllabus, application audit, a very small section. And for the um, new syllabus, it is covered as part of your IS audit, right? So application controls are broadly six, boundary, input, communication, processing, database, and output. What is boundary? Anything between one, one app or another app, one person or the another person. That's called boundary, right? An example could be you're accessing the Flipkart website. From Flipkart website, it has to go to, let us say, ICICI Bank. So that linkage, Flipkart boundary ends, ICICI Bank boundary. So that's called crypto. The, to ensure that there is a safety, you ensure there is a crypto, right? Second, my boundary is... I am here, you are a computer. How do we both interact with the help of username, password? So all these are examples of boundary controls. Next is input controls. Input controls can be of four types, source document, data coding, batch, and validation. Source document input controls is very simple, like a checkbook, pre-numbered, they're in a sequence, and you periodically audit that. What are the input controls, coding errors, transcription, transposition, character number confusion, uppercase, lowercase, etc. Then you have batched controls. Batch control of three types, financial total. Example, you are uploading all the data into GST website. Okay. GST one, one, you're uploading all the sales details. Now, what is the biggest concern for you? That whether all my sales have been appropriately reported or not. So in my tally, it says five lakh sales. In GST website, it says five lakh sales. Very good, financial total matching. Next, in your tally, there are 10 invoices. In GST website, 10 invoices. Document control or record count matching. But is there any way to ensure my GST invoice number is not mentioned against your amount or your GST number, right? There is no mechanism. And that mechanism is called hash total. What it will do, it will sum total the serial numbers multiplied into the invoice numbers or GST number multiplied into invoice number. Therefore, one unique number will come. That unique number before upload and after upload, it will check. Both of them matching, it makes sense. When you're filing your TDS return, because now it's July, you'll be filing TDS return. Form 27A, if you generate, on the top corner, you'll find hash total. I think we spoke of hierarchy of database. Relating to that is validation controls. The validation controls can be at all these three stages. File, record, field. It'll start from field, go to record, and then go to file. For example, field interrogation. You're filling up a form. It has a limit on the age, 18 to 60 years only for insurance. Picture check, you're asked to check multiple pictures. Where it code sign, you cannot enter a negative number. Check digit, your PAN and other, your last four digits of an other or GST number, last two or three digits, or in case of a PAN, right? Uh, the last digit, all these are check digits so that even if you interchange any alphabet, the last digit will give a validation. Arithmetic check, provision for bad debts plus your actual debts, should be the net amount of debts, right? So whatever, cross-check, mathematic check. Record integration, reasonableness check. So you're mentioning some data in previous page, something different here, separate, reasonableness. Valid sign, sequence check. File integration, what version you're using? Are you uploading the latest version, like ROC forms? Are you uploading the latest version? Data file security, all those things are file integration. 
communication control it's all about communication between source to destination transmission guided unguided you know wireless wifi public private all of those comes into communication and then we looked into output controls output controls are nothing but ensuring that the cia confidentiality integrity availability of data is maintained you know who has access to output who can print the report who can log out the program log in the program all of those is your output controls right with that the disa 2.0 most of it comes to an end disa 3.0 you have a topic on emerging technologies just to be aware of it even 2.0 just to be at a high level aware they're not asking questions on this right let's quickly look into it ai ai is all about advanced computing system that can simulate human beings what all can it do speech recognition learning planning etc types of ai has given you can look into it what are the challenges very important ai is not that very advanced you cannot create a level of trust privacy and security it next is a concept of blockchain a blockchain in a layman's languages you have to put it in a very very simple perspective it is every transaction is authenticated by a peer network you and your friends are authenticating a transaction before it is posted into your common group or you are posting in whatsapp all your friends are giving a thumbs up that means they are authenticating every transaction whatsapp is not blockchain i'm just giving an example how it works so the moment you send a transaction all three of your friends approve it then it gets stored in an encrypted fashion so that nobody can alter it right it gets pushed into one box and that box is encrypted so that nobody can alter it and every time this box box you can call it as block this block keeps on getting added to a series of chain and therefore blockchain there are five features of a blockchain very important a it has a distributed database that means all the data is stored in all the systems peer to peer transmission all the four people it's not a server client architecture all four systems are on par with each other your data my data everything will be same irreversibility even if there is a mistake you cannot rectify it both of us all of us have to agree only to rectify uh, reverse it and there is a computational logic every time the transaction goes into system there is a logic which is followed risk are huge scalability is a challenge interoperability is a challenge you know legal compliance is a challenge vendor risk is a challenge last is cloud i think we already spoke about cloud i'm not spending too much time here but there's just one example of how you can understand a cloud what is your responsibility what is the pass responsibility and saas responsibility right and then you have what is called analytics analytics is all about usage of digital data analyze things in a slightly different fashion so that you are able to get the results you use multiple tools and techniques for analysis right warehouse i already spoke marts i spoke business intelligence is nothing but giving you dashboards database is where rows and columns data lake examination as question data lake is structured and unstructured data internal and external data all of them put together is your data lake so data lake example is i have my internal sales data i also have some economic trends or gdp analysis combine both of them for me to take a decision data science the art of or the science of identifying patterns using data or using statistical methods right so just like a scientist you discover something in data scientist he discover something on the data Right? and these are the four types of analytics descriptive what went hap- what happened prescriptive what how did uh, you know how did it make it happen predictive is more like what should what could prob- probably happen cognitive using machine to understand all of this then you have iot iot in layman's language is sensor sending information sensor sending information sensor sending your watch sending some information to your, uh, you know about your heart or your uh, number of steps you have taken or your alexa responding to a, a, a sensor bulb etc all of those and this is a simple architecture you have devices which is actually connected to a gateway the gateway in turn is connected to a cloud gateway where they do some bit of analysis and a decision is basically taken Right? Challenges are, you know, it is, uh, you know, your devices are hearing you. They're gathering so much information. What if, you know, somebody else they share the information? Privacy concerns, insecurity, etc. Those are your challenges. And last is your RPA. RPA is not a walking, talking robot. It is basically an automated program, right? It can do a repeated activity. A simple example: most of your softwares have a simple feature, income tax software. You click a button, it will go to the win. It will what is that? It will go to this uh, income tax website. Download all of those. save that into a pdf or a notepad and give some basic analysis by click of a button 10 steps it is doing that is an rpa right improvise accuracy you know manage skills cost saving etc the risk is that rpa strategy could go wrong that it should go go wrong you know the projects or operationals could probably go wrong last thing which i'm going to spend a few minutes is on important as far as each of the 
chapters are concerned. So this is a list which is there. In which case, the presentation will have that. So I'm not spending too much time there. In the interest of time, I want to stop it over here and I want to open it up for questions. I've taken exactly three hours. As promised, I've tried to cover it. Anybody wants to question, ask questions, I can will allow you to mute yourself. I have tried my whatever possible in this three hours I have given you that, right? And I have actually told that this is open only for those who have donated, but I've kept it fairly open-ended just with the intention of sharing knowledge, nothing more. But if you are able to donate it or get, be happy. And more importantly, just to give a, a perspective, at least about, uh, uh, I think about already about 100 or 400 or had already donated last time. So I have given this session for free for them and rest of them, you're always welcome. What I will do before you sign off, I will give you a few basic things into the chat window. The first thing is, where is the chat window? Give me a minute. Yeah, PPT, I will upload it. Give me some time. Let me have uh, my uh, dinner and then probably I'll do it or tomorrow you'll have it uploaded, right? So the first thing is I'm giving you the foundation link. The second thing is I'm giving you the WhatsApp group link, right? The third thing which I'm giving you is the Google Drive link where you have all information. Google Drive link where I've spoken about all of those, most of it is there. The Google Drive, whatever I've spoken, everything is there. Right, so I think I've given you the Google Drive link, I've given you the WhatsApp link, and I've given you this. And just for information, the WhatsApp will is, is going to be group is going to be active even after this thing. I will be sharing some updates on IT technology trends and practices. That is something post mortem. First, let us focus on clearing the exit. Anybody wants to share a quick feedback? Anything? Uh, Vikram, there is no single place. There's all over all over the internet. You'll have to read for it. All right. Thank you so much. I hope you had a great, uh, interesting session. I have put all the links in the WhatsApp group also. I will share it once again by end of the day. So please be a little patient. And uh, I think that's about it. Thank you.